there's a story, I don't know how true this is, but like one of the first ever like multiplayer games was on Play-Doh. And apparently some of the parents went to the Urbana police and begged them to kind of like influence the university to shut it off at like 9 p.m. so that these kids would actually get some sleep and get some homework done because they spent all their time playing these games. Um, but it was like, it was like an, an interesting, like just localized experience. I think there are going to be a lot of unexpected things ahead of us and we're going to have to learn to adapt and not be scared up front, um, but to also have, you know, safety checks in place. This is something I wish somebody had told me was that don't be scared to ask for feedback before something is complete. Um, the discussions that you have, like the back and forth will make things so much better. Whereas I had this tendency to be such a perfectionist and I didn't want to show anybody anything until it was like near done, but it's never done, right? Like it'll never be done. And so the sooner, you, the more iterations you go through something, the better something's going to be. And I don't, I didn't understand the value of iteration um, until graduate school. I hope that's a space that universities can go to and allow for more interdis interdisciplinarity and not have silos in departments or disciplines. Like there was a time when you could be a philosopher and, you know, you could do medicine and philosophy and, you know, poetry. And that was the norm. Welcome to the UAUC Talk Show. Our goal with the show is to introduce you to the most interesting people with the most interesting ideas. Today, we're having a conversation with Dr. Karahalius. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, so you've done a lot of work in social behavior and like social media right? And you're, you're studying the patterns and the implications of all of it, right? So if you had to make a social media app today, how would you make it? You mean the process I would use to make it? Like, or... wh like what would be your guiding principles be? My guiding principles. Um, so I started out, you know, caring a lot more about the technology. I used to be an electrical engineer. Right. Well, I guess I, I still am kind of, but my undergrad degree was in electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, I focused a little bit more on the technology. Um, then I moved towards HCI and I focused more on the human. Um, and then I moved towards what I would argue is more community centered computing. So I would focus on the community, like how you would make a tool that allows for cohesive community interaction where people can where people can have shared values mm -hmm. um, so one of the challenges I mean that we see with interfaces today um, is that they're changing in scale and speed in ways that we're just not used to I mean if you think about it the telegraph is social media the telephone is social media um, the telegraph is also social media, smoke screens. Right. Um, well, I think I mentioned the telegraph, the telegraph, the telephone, like smoke screens are social media. Um, it's like, there's so many ways to communicate. And I would argue that you want people to be able to have a conversation um, where they understand the norms in the conversation and where they can know what they're responding to. So certain things you need in a channel, you need in a channel. One, you need the ability to um, know when it's your turn to speak or have a channel to be able to speak. Um, you have to have a channel for some form of correction. So for example, if I say something and you look really confused, um, I can, I can like go into repair mode and see that you misunderstood what I said, misunderstood what I said and try to correct it. Mm -hmm. um, you need that in, a, in an online channel too, even when you can't see the person's face. Right. Um, so I would argue those are some of the things that I would value. Um, but ultimately, I could predict anything I want and I won't know how people will, will use it 
And so you need to have a process in place by which you user test something before you release it to a crowd. And you need to user test it with small groups of people and then bigger groups of people and then groups of people that are different from you. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is, you know, test out a new tool with some of their best friends or some people down the hall. Um, because then you only get a sense of how a very select group of people use it, probably very similar in, you know, demographics. And ultimately, we are a big, you know, diverse community. Mm -hmm. And we need to see how different groups of people will use tools, not and not just designed for us, but designed for other communities as well. So that's the, that's, I would say, the standard framework, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what would you base the app on? Like, what would the idea be? Like, if, like for example, Instagram is like, you're sharing photos, videos, and that's like, one of the ways to communicate your life or like how you're interacting with others, right? Um, TikTok is more where you have short, short form videos and it's like fast, like short mm -hmm. attention based content. Um, on your social media app, what would the product be like? Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. So one, one thing I want to preface is that a lot of these ideas are on like Instagram and um, and Snapchat and all of those things. All of these things have been like ideas people have had before, mm -hmm. um, but people actually created companies around them. Um, and it's, it's the people that created the companies that are on these ideas that, you know, that made that company. There's lots of these smaller things around, you know, prior to that. Um, I actually value at the moment, and, and these things change, I value sort of smaller segments of communication where you have smaller groups of people. Hmm. that might um, connect. I don't think it's just about the photograph. I don't think it's just about the text. I think right. a lot of it is how you start forming the communities to begin with and how you reach people and then how you help create norms for how they use them. So, I mean, if you think about, if you think about Twitter, for example, the idea of retweeting, that was grassroots. That was people creating that. And then the company saw that and made it part of the actual product itself. Um, and so I would create a tool for smaller groups of people. Um, and then I would work with them. Like I wouldn't release it just on the fly and see what happens. Um, I would see what they might want. And I would be really curious, like to create something maybe very specifically for a group of people, um, as opposed to something that's one size fits all to be used for everyone. And I would really love to have some type of toolkit where maybe I have some framework and some, some basic infrastructure, and then let the communities actually fine tune it for what they need. Um, this idea of personalizing for your group set of values, for your group's needs, I think is something that is kind of missing in this one size fits all system that we have today. Um, and people are trying to appropriate what we have today already, and, and they've done that historically. Um, like they have different moderating principles, um, but what if they could also have something where they could highlight, like, let's say just hypothetically, I'm creating, I'm, I, my family happens to be Greek. Um, and let's say we want to have something from, you know, my, my parents' village. Um, there are certain things that we commemorate, like certain holidays, there are certain customs. Um, if there was a way to incorporate that into the site um, and give it its own personal identity, you know, that would be something that would unite the people a little bit more and hopefully offer something mm -hmm. that they might not get otherwise. I also want to, I would want to make sure that the site did not take away from the opportunity for face-to-face -face interaction. So for example, one thing we see a lot is, you know, you make tools where you can send a message or, you know, look at a video of a person and you're like, well, because I sent the message and they're okay, it means I don't have to go there and visit. Um, I think that a lot of the social media is great to connect people, especially when people are remote. Um, but I get frustrated when I see things that, where I otherwise might have just walked over to a house, just stopped by for a cup of coffee. Um, and you see this a lot with the elderly. For example, people put in cameras, um, you have a busy day at work, you can see that somebody's okay, why bother to go visit? Um, I think this idea of finding a way to prioritize certain types of interaction 
Um, and maybe letting the technology say, look, you know, why not visit? Mm-hmm. Uh, why not have a face to face, you know, encounter as opposed to just communicating online? Um, I think that's something that we very much need today and we're not getting with some of today's um, social media infrastructures. But how would you make it so that people can have those face-to-face interactions? How, how would you integrate it with the app? So that's, I mean, my entire area of research is called human computer interaction. I mean, what you just described is something that would take, you know, a significant amount of time to do. Right. I mean, you'd start by making prototypes of a system. You'd see what people do with a prototype and you move on from there. I mean, the biggest mistake you could make is design it from scratch from beginning to now and then see what people do. Because by that point, you're too invested in what you've built to make the changes that you needed to have made like months ago. Hmm. So part of this process is is knowing that you can't decide you can't design the full thing from scratch. So patience is a huge part of it too. Right. Um, so human computer interaction, community computer interaction involves an element of participatory design where you have to work with the people to create it. A lot of what you see with, I, I can't say all, because I don't know how all of these systems that we use today were created, but were designed by somebody that that possibly thought, this is how I would like to communicate with somebody, hmm. so I'm going to have the whole world communicate this way. Right. And in many ways, like designing it from scratch like that would be against many of the principles that um, that we need for community computing. One of the like paradox of like social media, in my opinion, is that it was like the idea is to like bring people together, right? Like regardless mm-hmm. of which part of the world you're on, you can still communicate with each other. You can still mm-hmm. have a video call with each other and still get be connected. But it has somehow made us more isolated in a way. Like we're, it, it has become an excuse to not interact with someone personally. Yeah, sometimes. Right. So how can we change that attitude though? So I think one, I think it's important to know that there's positives and negatives on social media. Right. So for example, for folks that um, might have been isolated, excuse me, let me just stop my phone from ringing. Um, so you get interrupted a lot too, <laughs> see? That's that's another issue. Like That's why I will never get an Apple yeah. Watch. So you're like in the <laughs> middle of doing something and you get interrupted. Um, that actually affects your, your behavior as well. Um, and many people are studying that right now. Um, but I want to say that there are some positives. So, for example, for so some people who feel isolated or may feel different, to find other people like them online, um, that can be incredible. And there's been many studies that show that um, if you have certain types of connections and people to talk to online, it can help with your mental health. So that is amazing. Um, and then there are many people that um, have studied social media around isolation. So, for example... You know, a few decades ago, somebody wrote this paper about how being on social media makes you depressed or being online makes you depressed. Mm. Um, but we have to tease that apart a little bit more. And it turns out they did a follow-up paper to that work that found out that not all types of being online are the same. So, for example, if you are, you know, you can consume social media and you can produce social media. They found that people that produce social media um, end up having some better outcomes than people that only consume. Hmm. Um, and so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and then there's different types of forms of production. Um, you know, this podcast that you're making is one form of production. Um, on Facebook, I can write posts. I can, and, you know, I can try to reach out to audiences. I can start conversations. I can build communities. Um, if I'm, just consuming, and it, and it has this unfortunate derogatory term of lurking, um, you know, that has shown to be very harmful for some people. Um, at the same time, you see people that are extroverted that are a little bit more shy on social media and people that are introverted. Um, sometimes some of them become more extroverted on social media. But this idea of it making us isolated, um, again, depends on the community, depends on the person depends on so many different factors. Um, I, you know, I have been on social media since, you know, if I exclude the telephone, I think I got my first email account when I was a freshman in college. 
Um, and prior to that, I'd been playing with bulletin boards, um, you know, having made my own modem to, to connect to different sites. Um, it's been fascinating to see how it's changed over the years um, from using Usenet. Um, and again, I see one of the biggest changes is speed and scale. Right. Now, to bring that back to your, to your question about being isolated, um, people can feel isolated when things feel overwhelming to them. Mm. Um, people can feel isolated when they, you know, when they become anxious. People can feel isolated during a pandemic, like we're experiencing right now, when you're kind of forced to have physical isolation, and it can sometimes result in some forms of, of virtual isolation. Mm -hmm. um, but this idea really depends, the, the concept depends on the person. And it's precisely because of that, that I would like to see more tools that actually encourage face-to-face -face contact. So for example, instead of a tool that would tell me when to take my medication every day, um, you know, possibly a tool where I can, would remind me to go to a place where I can like meet with people. Um, and I mentioned this because of a study that we did many years ago where I spent some time living in a nursing home, just to give you an example of isolation versus not and how you can right. use technology. So we tried to make the best possible tools so that people could take their medication on time, so that we could get a sense of their vitals, like what their blood pressure was, if their weight was okay, if their heart rate was okay, if they'd fallen. So we went to a nursing home, we put all of the technology in there. Um, and then after, after a few weeks, people got used to it. Obviously it took some time to get everything to work properly. Um, some of these older buildings had three feet concrete walls and the Wi-Fi wasn't perfect. And so we, we fixed all of that. And then after, you know, after a significant amount of time of people using the tools, they came to us and they were like, yeah, it works, um, but we're miserable. I'm like, why? Um, and they're like, well, prior to the technology, every day at noon, we used to wait in line to get our medication. And while we waited in line to get our medication, we would make plans to go for a walk. We would make plans to go to the cinema to see a movie. Or we would say, you know, make plans to cook together or to eat together. By having all of this technology that did everything for them, they never had to leave their rooms. And so what's really interesting about this that didn't come out in your question, but I think will eventually come out, is the power dynamics about who makes the decisions hmm. for what happens. So the staff were like, this is great. You know, I can now eat lunch and I don't have to be there at lunch to give medication. Um, the, the people that, um, whose data was being used um, were not so happy about this, mm. but they didn't have much of a say in it in the beginning. Um, in the context of how do you design a tool, there's power dynamics there too, right? For example, let's say I'm, I ended up being the CEO of a company, I designed it, I designed it, and maybe I didn't ask every demographic, you know, who uses my tool, how to design it, which is why I'm really advocating for participatory design where you design a tool, you don't know how it's gonna turn out mm. until you work with the people that will ultimately use it. And you have to set yourself to be, prepare yourself to be open for the unexpected and for possibly designing something that might not have been your first choice. Um, and you just have to keep reminding yourself that that's okay. Mm. Um, but the power dynamics, I think is something that's a big and that we're gonna keep seeing in conversations around social media again and again and again. Um, and the reason I say this is because we're living in an era where, for example, you know, a company like Twitter, you know, can control who has access, um, you know, to the public, who can broadcast to the public. Um, you were living in an era where um, we have lots of people who use medical devices and the algorithms behind these, these devices are proprietary and they can't question an outcome of these devices. Uh, we're living in an era where an algorithm can make a decision in a courtroom, and because the algorithm is proprietary, you can't figure out why it said what it did, even though there are rights in our, you know, in our laws that dictate that you should know why you were accused of something. And so, you know, going back again to isolation, sorry. Um, you know, who designed something, why they design it, and for whom are things we should always be asking. And oftentimes, I see isolation happening when something was designed 
um, without input from the people who use it. Mm. And so I would again argue for, um, you know, forms of design that might be organic, that might be, that might change over time and that might allow input from people who use it, especially the vulnerable people who use it. You think it's just like, even though if you, let's say an app starts with the right motives and they do all the right testing and they work with all the right context, right? And it ends up being a very successful app. Do you think eventually profits take over and what comes next is what drives that company forward? I think there's two things. One, even sometimes if you have the best of intentions, the product might not be great. So for example, this is a very common, like in computer science, everybody wants an ISO 966541. Like everyone wants like a list that if I follow all of these rules, I will be ethical, I will be fair. Unfortunately, that's not how social tools work because they involve not just technology, but they involve people. And there's no ISO 966, like make up any number like, right. that, that um, can define how people will behave. And so, and, and there's things that are unexpected. You know, just example, there was a company that was making blogging software. Um, they were using a tool to message each other as they were debugging the software. And it turns out that's what took off SMS. Uh, SMS was meant for like debugging. Um, and I think it was like debugging some type of telephone network. Uh, there was another group that was making something else. It had like a blog-like infrastructure. That ended up, that wasn't what they planned. It was like the blogging type thing that took off and not what they were actually designing, but what they were using to design the blog. <laughs> uh, to, to, I'm sorry, what they were using to design the tool. Right. And so you always see these like things that are unexpected along the way. And a lot of these, some, some of these tools like SMS and blogs weren't necessarily the intended product, but were something that was, was created to help something else, but ended up being kind of cooler than what they intended to create. Um, and so, Yes, like oftentimes we have the best of intentions and sometimes they can backfire. Um, once like, and then the second part to your question, which is about um, like, how do you monetize something? I think it's what you were getting at. Right, so like eventually everything ends up being monetized, right? Like you need something for the company to keep running and doing what it does. So yeah. do you think at some point every company just comes to that point where they need to listen to profits over ethics so i i can't speak for every company right it depends on how they choose to monetize um advertising um is one path that um many companies have taken towards monetization um i mean that's been a really interesting path because it was one that advertising doesn't have that much regulation it's shocking Hello, regulation there is in advertising. Maybe, you know, one approach is if there was more regulation in advertising that might have um, different outcomes. It's hard to say unless we try it, unless somebody like dares enough to try to regulate the advertising industry. Um, when you don't use advertising, you end up using some types of other models. Um, you could crowdfund something. You can use a subscription model. Um, it's there there have been cases where the advertising model has not had the intended consequences mm. um, and we've seen that in many social media sites um, and we've also seen infrastructures around advertising that have violated the laws like so for example um, there are laws that say that you cannot discriminate, you cannot target, you know, race, gender, ethnicity around loans, housing, or job applications. Mm. And it's been found in many social media sites that advertisements were going directly to these groups of people. Right. Um, and so um, because of that, I mean, that, that clearly violated a law, caused some disparity. It's hard to measure exactly how much, but it did definitely cause disparity. And it reinforces certain stereotypes. So I think that that causes harm. Um, it would be, I mean, I would be interested in seeing how 
policy experts would want to regulate advertising because I think that would be um, an interesting path to pursue, at least in some small segment to see how it works out and then to move forward from that. Some companies have moved on to being B corporations, like trying to try something new there. Um, but I do think that when a company, whether it's social media company or not, any company, when they have shareholders and they have to make a decision about when they have money, um, whether to give it to shareholders or to reinvest to make a product that's better for the people to use it, I do think that there needs to be some more thinking in place and possibly some more regulation that if you have a company that affects, you know, millions of people, that you don't only put your money back to the shareholders and you have to think about what happens to, you know, the people that use your tool. And again, I can't emphasize this enough, the vulnerable people that use your tool, because oftentimes they're the ones that suffer the most. So this idea of, you know, let's say you have this income, how do you, how do you reinvest it? Um, there are shareholders, there are, you know, many people who use your tools, and then there are your advertisers who are also your clients. Mm. Um, and so there's this complicated dynamic that you kind of have to tease apart about, um, about who you satisfy. And there is no, you know, one right answer. But what I do know that needs to happen is that, especially with respect to advertising, um, it would, the, the level of profiling that happens needs to be addressed to a certain degree, especially in those three areas that I mentioned, um, loans, um, jobs, and housing. I mean, that, that is critical, hmm. um, that we don't discriminate. Cause that's like a, that's a violation of like the Federal Housing Act and many civil rights laws that we have today. And that type of advertising is still happening today. Um, with other forms of advertising, um, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a crazy world. Um, in many of these situations, you just need to put in these ads and you only need like one hit and like 10,000 for a company to make a profit. Mm. Um, at the same time, there are, there are, um, benefits to advertising, right? We can get access to things for free. Um, at, at the expense of, you know, certain, you know, amounts of data about ourselves. So I would strongly recommend to you and to your listeners this book uh, called Surveillance Capitalism um, by Shoshana Zuboff. It's, it's an excellent book that details the intricacies of what happened to our online world once we went down the path of using advertising as a model for, um, for revenue. Hmm. And it's fascinating to look at it from the different perspectives that she talks about. Um, and how difficult it is to go back once you go down that road. Interesting. So I saw, like, this is one of my, the favorite documentaries that I watched, mm -hmm. but I've uh, probably watched it, The Social Dilemma. Yes. Um, like, when I saw that, like, it, it all made sense. And, like, that concept of how the algorithm and, like, how the apps are designed for people to keep coming back um to it and how like they have a very good vi they had a very good visu visualization of everything like um mm -hmm. they were following an example of a person and um the like company like the people behind the scenes were like okay there's a model and they would study him and, like okay this person has not been on this uh site yeah, for like yeah, yeah. so long what's happening let's send him a notification yeah yeah and then, yeah and like his phone pings and then he's back online and like it it, it really like made me think okay I, like this happens to me too like I see a notification and open it and um, the like the way that these apps are just designed, it's just ingenious and like it's kind of crazy how these algorithms work and how they're even able, they're able to figure out the human psyche. And one of the things that was mentioned in that documentary was that like these apps and technologies have evolved so fast, but our brains are still primitive. Like yeah, we still yeah, yeah crave that um, external validation and we care about that number of likes or that comment and that just makes us keep coming back to it and how that is one of the reasons why so many people are feeling depressed even if they have like a maybe a thousand followers that doesn't matter but um, like the it has affected them in ways that is like 
permanent. Yeah, I mean, I, I had some issues with that movie, but overall, I'm glad that it increased awareness of right. what was happening. Um, I think there's several things that, like to tease apart what you said, like number one, I think it's so important that people are aware of the algorithms at play. Right. Um, and so awareness is something okay. that, um, you know, we did a study several years ago, um, and it turns out that in 2015, um, many people had no clue that Facebook was curating the posts that they saw on Facebook. They assumed that they saw every single post that their friends sent. Right. Um, in 2017, somebody replicated the study and found the same thing. Today, I would hope that people, you know, would know more. Mm -hmm. But awareness, awareness is critical, um, especially when, you know, you see people like, you know, I see five-year-olds using, you know, Netflix and YouTube. And I ask them, like, why is this thing at the top? They're like, because it's better. Hmm. Like, what makes it better? They're like, it's just better. Um, this idea of algorithmic intervention, like, I think people should should know about it. I don't know if it means putting a stamp on something, but making people aware that they're not seeing everything or that there's some form of prioritization or even what values go into that prioritization, I think, is key. Um, two things outside of that. I do think that... Um, tools need to give you some sense, some signal, so you can create a mental model of what that tool is doing. Right. Because if you don't understand that, that becomes extremely difficult to use that tool as you move forward. Um, and so we've done, we've done some work around this area of mental models um, and how to help people form them. And what we found is that when people do create these mental models, um, they become engaged in a different way with the tool. They become engaged in a way where they feel that it benefits them more and improves their experience with it. Mm. Um, the other thing, just to address one of your points, um, so I, I also want to argue for contestability mm. towards algorithmic systems, where if an algorithm gives me an output, like I would love some levers or some buttons to be able to push back and say no. Um, either give me something else or you're wrong. Um, to start ha moving more towards like human algorithm interaction. Mm. Like I've talked about human computer interaction, community computing, um, but this idea of being able to push back, um, because right now, like the power dynamic is there, it's very one sided. I get what they give me. Um, every now and then you see an interface where you can say hide something, um, but it's just, it's cumbersome. Nobody ever does that. Mm. Nobody ever does that. And not only that, but like, let's say you're even bullied and you want to use the bullying interface. You never even get an acknowledgement that, you know, on this day at this time, you know, you put in a request for something to be done about this. And so this idea of contestability, I think, is key. Um, you mentioned one other point, and I just wanted to make sure I remembered my brain. I should be taking notes here. I'm sorry. <laughs> the notifications, maybe? Um, not notifications. What was the other thing? Um, people feel, it was about how people felt, I think. Um, about them feeling more like, like craving more external validation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think there, like, I, I feel that if people had, what's the right word? Um, you know, not all life is online. Mm -hmm. I feel like if we had in schools, you know, you know, online, see, less interruptions, <laughs> um, also from like social media. Um, like, I think if people have good relationships with their families, I think if people have good relationships with their peers, um, you know, extending those into social media can be great, mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, but this idea of relying on external validation um, in, from so many places and that being your sole signal of approval um, is troubling. So I, I do think it's important for people to be involved in multiple communities. So for example, let's say you have your school community, your family community, you're involved in clubs. Um, historically, um, that's been a good way to um, improve your mental health because let's say something doesn't go so well in one community, you can fall back in a different community. Mm. But if you have mm. like one Twitter community um, and something doesn't go right there or one Instagram community um, and it's big, right? Um, and you don't get the likes that you think you want. 
um, that can be devastating. So where do you fall back to? Mm. So it's, it's important to have fallbacks, whether they be online or in person, but having all of your identity and your self-worth based in one community has always been problematic. Mm. And so I think it is important to help people have face-to-face and online communities and not there be just one. You know, I've had this idea for this kind of social media app mm-hmm. that, so on campus there are always things happening, but you don't know what it's happening because maybe it's not your major. Yeah. Maybe you can create some sort of like map that would tell you, hey, there's this is a event here. And people will, like, people will submit it like, hey, there's this thing here. Hey, mm-hmm. Feel free to come. Like, it's just, it's, it's fine. You can come if you, if you like, which goes back to the, I was telling you, the, the UAC Free Food Twitter account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which... It's kind of become like that for people because like, oh, here, free food. Like yeah, sometimes yeah, people yeah. have like ec- excess free food and they just post it there and they just, okay, done. Like that that um, that um part is done because, you know, people are hungry and then we have excess food that we would have thrown away. Here, take it. And then it's like, it doesn't matter who you are. But that also provides an opportunity for social interaction. That's a catalyst for that. And so that part of it is actually quite beautiful. Because people might go for the food, but they'll meet somebody else while they're there also and maybe talk to them. The same. Yeah. yeah. And especially if you're in line, then you'll talk to somebody. And so I love the idea of apps that do something like that, that offer, you know, some other form of, of engagement and not just, you know, not only online engagement. And I'm not, right. I'm not dissing online engagement. You know, it can be great. Um, but variety is good. Right. And so that goes back to something I, I, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts is that, so you eat your free food, probably one of the most helpful things in terms of like food insecurity. It's a big mm-hmm. issue, like most campuses here, it's a big issue. Obviously you see how, because how many people follow it. But if I had the intention, okay, I'm gonna help food insecurity, which I'm very honest, that was not my intention of, of creating this. Mm-hmm. I just kind of stumbled upon it. But um, like I see many people trying to fix food insecurity and they would have never arrived at something like this, which turns out to be more helpful than the other things. I'm not saying one is better than the other, it just it depends yeah, on what yeah, people yeah. use more. Uh, which is, which so is explain like, to me what you mean by food insecurity, because I, I, I can imagine that meaning several different things. So the definition, the definition I'm gonna use is basically people who are hungry, mm-hmm. who either cannot, don't have the time or cannot afford to eat. Okay. And therefore they're all okay. hungry. Okay. That's the definition. Okay. Uh, so the definition of, of uh, so like that's, that's that and then people being hungry, whatever. Mm-hmm. So that was not my intention though. My intention was yeah. not yeah. to fix food insecurity. Uh, how I created it is what I was taking this differential equations class. Mm-hmm. I was bored and it was before the finals. It was like a day like today, last semester. And I was just uh, underwhelmed, was bored. So I, yeah. I got this idea, I went home, started coding at 9 p.m., was done by 4 a.m. Not a smart thing because I had a final the next day, mm-hmm. but whatever. But uh, anyway, so I did that, whatever, like, okay, it's a cool project, why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it didn't, ended up becoming a pretty useful thing. So that goes back to the design philosophy that we were talking about is that, you know, like we should design things with respect of the users, mm-hmm. but I would have never arrived at that conclusion if I was thinking about what people wanted. Like you knew that people wanted food. Well, it's like one. It's like saying people wanted interaction. We all want interaction. It's like, uh, for instance, I was, I was I, at the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time I talk to someone, like, oh yeah, I've been trying to meet people, and like, oh, thank you for saying hi. Like, we yeah, all yeah. want to meet more people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we there's always like this thing. Like, we all like we all know what we, what we want. Like, you know, food, love, community. But uh, it's not like we don't like the. It's like a non-trivial path to. Actually, but you, but you, you actually thought more about this than you think you did. I mean, if you look at the first version of Facebook. The first version of Facebook had people's pictures. Right. There was no, like, what we call today, the feed used to be called a wall. They added that later when they're like, people want interaction. You've had the benefit of looking at what people have wanted in other sites, and you use that to create what you did. Um, and so I think there is that element in there of borrowing from existing tools that, you know, showed you what people want. But food, I mean, is a basic need. Um, and you've probably seen lots of people like crowd around pizza or crowd around other free items. And I'm guessing that that helped guide you there. And, you know, if this were a project that I were building, you know, I would put out a formative version of it. And then I would probably keep tweaking it afterwards when I saw how people used it and see how I changed it. And sometimes you only just change. Oh, one other thing I think is super important is it's not just the tool that you build, but it's also how you advertise it and the workflow for the tool. 
So, for example, like who is the person that's like putting out the posts? Um, how often do you do it? Um, you know, to which groups do you advertise it? Um, so maybe I could illustrate this better with an example, but um, like changing the dynamics of how you use a tool can be really fascinating, especially in, in like machine learning. So like, for example, um, this isn't social media. Forgive me if I use a medical example, but um, there are, you know, many researchers today working on tools where you can use machine learning to help you with decision making. Um, I don't want to say diagnosis per se, because like, but to help you make, event, but to help you form a decision. And so let's say I use a tool right now. Um, and let me just use an example. And I'm making this up around like mammography for breast cancer. And so I create this tool. I, you know, I see the patient, I get a scan. Um, the scan goes into some machine learning algorithm, but then I have a choice. I have a choice in that I show the decision of the algorithm to the, the doctor or the clinician at the same time as they're making their decision, or I show it to them after they make their decision. So in one recent case, they found that when you show it to somebody as they make the decision, it influences them. Right. If you show it to them after they've already made their decision, they're hard fast and stick to their decision and they, they don't want to change their mind. Mm -hmm. So if you think of the, the pipeline of when you introduce information to people, it's not just a technology, but it's also the decisions, the social decisions we make around how we choose to present that technology to folks um, that can be interesting. Um, so the, the idea of like, I remember when I was in graduate school, we had a free food camp. So we had a kitchen. It was, it was so widely used. Um, and there was like a camera and whenever there was like food there, you know, you could see it. And right. then people built on top of that. And then somebody is like, well, they built like a, a, you know, a diff. I mean, this was like in the like yeah. early nineties. Um, and so then whenever they noticed a difference in the, in the <laughs> image, yeah. like, there'd be like this bell sounding and people would like run to that space. <laughs> so in terms of sociality, you know, some of the things that we do know uh, around spaces and sociality that we do know that food brings people together. Um, you know, one of the things like one of my favorite researchers, I don't know what to call him. Maybe he's an urbanologist. His name is William White. Um, he studied social spaces, physical social spaces and what made them popular. Mm -hmm. And he found that food made spaces popular, like having water made spaces popular, having what he called triangulation, which was like having like a magician, something that people could look at and talk to each other, even if they don't know each other, mm -hmm. because there was that magician there. And food is a triangulating factor as well. Um, he found trees. But the number one thing he found that helped people, you know, hang out in a space was having a place to sit. And not just any place to sit, like, cause there's like this, like, our concrete architectural benches, right. that are great in photographs, but are really uncomfortable to sit on. But he found that, you know, a specific type of chair was good to sit on. Um, and so his work actually changed zoning laws across the country for how to make, like, good parks. Now, if you take that analogy and you want to translate it to social media, like, what is the equivalent of a chair in a virtual space? Like, what would, what would we need there? And so if you look at Facebook, um, you could argue that, you know, the Facebook feed is kind of like a piazza. It's kind of like a, a public forum. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that people looked at were the likes. Um, and so all of those other signals were what were, were like, like getting people there. So it was a place to see and be seen. Right. Um, and so some of these things work great uh, in a public space, though. Like if I were to go to the quad, I can mostly see who's watching me and who's not. Right. Like that metaphor breaks when you get into social media because you can have so many more people watching you that you can see. So making sense of these um, sort of catalysts for interaction mm -hmm. can become a little bit harder. But I've, I've actually derailed from your point. You were talking about designing your tool. Like, yeah, like design um, philosophy. Yeah. And so sometimes, you know, one of the ways you design is you make a prototype. You see what people do with it and you modify it based on that. And it sounds like your prototype you know, people used it. And I'm assuming they still use it. But you could probably tweak it afterwards if you wanted to modify it for a specific a group of people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and that, that, that's the thing that is, uh, that is an issue is that uh, usually in, you know, Silicon Valley where a lot of things are happening is that the, 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 the mentality is, you know, you, I guess, 
you know, think uh, Facebook said this, like, you know, move move fast and break things or stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is the idea of like, you know, make something people want to use it, yes or no. Uh, which it seems like more like the sciencey approach in the sense of like, you know, you make a hypothesis, you test it instead of uh, mm -hmm. asking, you know, like people like, hey, you're hungry and you don't, you cannot buy food. Like, what would you like us to create? Which is like, it's hard because it, it's, they don't know what they want in a sense. So yeah, you bring up a great point. Well, two things, two things there. One, the move fast and break things mentality, like could have worked really well with engineering when people weren't involved. You know, once you have people involved, mm -hmm. um, it's important to protect the people. And so if my goal, you know, was to create a chip, yeah, I can move fast, um, you know, break the chip, make a, you know, send it, like, if I were designing a chip, I would send it to a firm, they would bring me back the chip. And if it didn't work, I would just keep doing that again and again and again and again. Um, and that would be fine. Um, the second something that I build can affect an entire country like Myanmar, you know, breaking things isn't always acceptable if it affects not only people's livelihoods, but pe but life and death. Um, so this idea of, and then that was one point. The second point that you make is people don't always know what you want. And that's, that's so true. And so when we do these design type of, um, you know, these design like interrogations, um, one of the things that you find is exactly what you said. You'll ask people what they want and, and they don't know. And so there's other forms of design probes you can use to, um, and speculative design is one of these things, um, where you can help prod people in certain ways. And so one of the things we do is we build lots of different things um, so people can see possibilities of what can happen. And once people start seeing the possibilities of what could happen, um, it's easier for them to sort of like think outside of their comfort zone um, keep in mind, though, that oftentimes what they come up with is like a weighted sum of these possibilities that you show them. So we kind of bias them. But at the same time, we try to show them like capabilities of what's possible and then see what they do with it. Um, if you ask somebody to, you know, just to, if you bring somebody to a table and just tell them, like, what is the ideal thing you would want to build ever? People can't answer that question. People can't answer that question because there's too many axes for them to think about at that moment. Mm -hmm. If you constrain the problem for them a bit and say, like, what is the best tool you would want to build for this situation? It's easier for them to answer that question. And at the same time, if you want, um, like, can, let me give another example just because it's easier. Um, we were doing some studies around how people about content moderation. So a lot of people were upset on Instagram, for example, when their content was getting removed. Mm -hmm. So if I was an artist, let's say, and my images were getting removed because they showed nude figures, but that was what's expected in the art world, right? Or let's say that um, that um, I was overweight and my images were removed from TikTok. Um, and the argument they gave was they didn't want people to be shamed. Um, for example, like, how do you, how do you have a voice against a big entity? Uh, like, how would you want to communicate with an entity like this? And so, you know, we brought in lots of people. They, they were like, I don't know, you know. And so what we did is we had lots of different interactions. Um, and in one of them, you know, in, in some of these things, they're very concrete. In some of them, you make them to be like a little bit more fantastical. So in some cases, we design interfaces with different forms of buttons, and we let them rearrange where the buttons were. In some other situations, um, we told them that you could have a magic mug. Hmm. And in this magic mug, i like, what would you want to do? Um, and people were like, well, I want to yell into this thing. And whenever I yell into it, it goes directly to the CEO's ears. And so the idea is you try to cover lots of different forms of communication. And then... The first thing that you start seeing that comes out of the, the values that people have, and that's important because these companies need to know the values that people want in the tools that they use. And the second thing is like slowly you start to tease apart what people really want. And you have to engage them in conversation for quite some time. So these, these conversations, like there were several of them and some of them lasted like up to three hours each. And by the end of it, even as a designer, like what we thought people wanted, we were kind of, you know, we were kind of wrong. Um, 
in the end, what people like, what one of the consensus things that happened wasn't that they wanted more technology. They actually wanted a group of their peers to actually make decisions about content moderation and not an algorithm. Mm -hmm. So, for example, let's say I'm an artist and let's say I'm black. Um, why can't people like me make decisions about people like me? Like, why is it like one algorithm fits all? Why right. is it people who are not not like me making these decisions? Um, and that came out over a series of iterations of some of these tools. And even if you think you want the solution to be a technology solution, oftentimes it's not. Oftentimes it has to be a human solution. And we have to be open to the idea that we need to have like socio-technical systems that involve, you know, sometimes technology, sometimes people, and sometimes both. The other thing with this personalization idea that you even mentioned earlier is that sure you can have you can have communities which are more relatable or like more relevant mm -hmm. to your um, liking and you can feel comfortable that would, that also gives the opportunity or the chance for polarization and like more hate, like for example let's say hate groups to like form and yeah. just for those voices to get amplified right like you're like in, in some way, the algorithms are also doing that, which by showing you the things that you want to see, mm -hmm. um, they're they're basically pro providing you the validation that you want to even further believe the things that you already do. Yep. Yeah. Which drives you to like the ends of spectrums, and like even though if it's personalized, um, you you may be in a group of people that think the same way that you do, and that would still lead to that polarization. So how, how do you prevent that or how do you tackle that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting. So there's two different types of personalization that we could, there's many different types, but right. two that I want to break up now. One of them is personalizing the workflow and the other one is personalizing the content. Right. Um, so you were describing personalizing the content. And one of the reasons, unfortunately, for that has been advertising. So for example, you know, people want to up engagement scores um, and the more you can keep people on the page, the more advertisements you can show. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, Zainab Tufekci had a really nice, um, you know, she's written a lot about this. I think she has a talk, talk, TED talk about this too, about how she was starting to watch something on YouTube. And over time, she found extreme content was, you know, auto playing next and showing up at the front. Hmm. And so, you know, one of the reasons for this was because of, you know, the wanting to keep people's eyeballs on that page for longer, longer periods of time. Right. Um, so that's a personalization of content to keep people, to keep people on there. If I were to personalize workflow, for example, I might value people not being on there. Like I might flip the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. And say that people shouldn't be looking at things for more than 10 minutes. So I'll only include engaging content for like X amount of minutes. Right. And then, you know, people are like, oh, I've seen everything there is to see here. I'll go off now and maybe come back later. Mm -hmm. And so being able to personalize that part of it is something that we can't do at the moment. And maybe it's something we should focus doing. Um, but I do think this idea of rethinking the workflows um, needs probably more discussion than we've given it right now. Um, I would love to see more work in that space. Mm -hmm. And I would be curious to see, um, you know, different types of socio-technical systems that allowed for that type of, of, of workflow change. Because it is something that we do, you know, we have town hall meetings, um, you know, in our cities and people discuss workflows all the time. Why can't we discuss them in our, you know, our socio-technical systems too? But then wouldn't you come up, end up with the same problem? Like if you, if you have, let's say you have a town hall discussion and you're mm -hmm. trying to be more inclusive, but it's still, at the end of the day, you're still, you still have a group of people who are deciding what an even larger group of people want. But you're having some input from people at least, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's no way in this world that we're going to get billions of people to agree on one thing. Exactly. We're not going to have that. But if we can hear from the vulnerable populations and we can hear from the people that aren't just the leaders, mm -hmm. and if people care enough about something and keep coming to these town halls um, and become active in the leadership, if we give them that opportunity, um, you know, then they can affect change. Right now, they don't have that opportunity at all. Um, like I can't change any policy at some of these big social media companies. Um, you know, it's, it's a big opaque box. 
which is why some people have advocated for open source or being created in their own social media, but you, you can because of these strong social network effects. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a, a migration now. I don't know how big it is towards Mastodon, for example, away from away from Twitter. Have you switched? Um, I can't say that I've switched. I have both. You have both. Yeah. I have both. Um, it's a, uh, but like you said, right? Like, I can't bring thousands of people with me. Like, I can take myself there and see who's there, but I can't bring. I can't bring everyone along for the ride. Um, and at the same time, there's, I bet there's people that don't even know what Mastodon is. And so there's the awareness issue. Like awareness is huge. Distribution. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Advertising. It's, just, it's like the same thing with it, with this talk show thing, right? Yeah. We can make it. We can work so hard. But if people don't know about it, do we, do we actually do anything? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I think what I mean, I've seen a lot of interesting social media sites be really successful, hmm. designed in you know in small groups of communities right. where people sit together. And there's there's actually precedent for that. Like one of my favorite precedents is um, uh, there's this great book, and I forgot the name of the author, but she writes about how, um, you know, in Great Britain, United Kingdom, um, there was a time when the monasteries took care of the roads. And then um, when, you know, the king decided that there was going to be one religion and he was going to be the head of it, um, the land was taken from the monasteries. But a, 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 a byproduct of that was that the roads were unkempt. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was people actually came together. They formed groups and they started building maps. And they started building these maps, not just to get from point A to point B, but to know which roads mm -hmm. were damaged so that you would know not to take those roads and they would get together to, to think about how to actually go about building that. Mm. And so this community came together because of a need. And they didn't know how they were going to solve the problem. Um, they were going like point by point, like we need to do this. So let's start doing it this way. And so we started seeing some of these crowdsourced tasks, crowdsourced tasks, ta <laughs> crowdsourced tasks emerged recently. Uh, so that's been like another big area where um, coordinating a bunch of people coming together um, sometimes has been happening by algorithms, sometimes has been happening by other people. Mm. Um, but this idea of people coming together to um, create something um, is not new. And another great example of that is the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, like they were taking in like people were sending in things mm. and people were actually mailing these things and they became part of the Oxford English Dictionary, like their use of words, like a, sen a word used in that sentence. And this, this, this idea of, of people seeing value in something, coming together to try to, to work on it. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many like social media sites that have been very successful, but just not widely known. Um, and some of these you see in, um, in like Native American uh, reservations. Some of these you see in, you know, more, um, more private groups. Um, and so I think another thing that we're, that we're seeing right now is this, this idea that, um, that more is better. Like if more people use something, it's a success. Um, but maybe that's not the case. Hmm. Maybe it's okay to have a lot of these tools used in small different groups. Localized. Yeah. yeah, and maybe they don't have to be used by millions of people to be a success. Um, so just a, a different way of, you know, reframing the the narrative around what is a successful tool. Yeah. And, and another example was uh, Wikipedia too, which is similar. Exactly, exactly. And arguably, you know, one of the best things in, civil, in civilization because of, how comprehensive it yeah. is in many languages and many things. Yeah. And only 80,000 people or so. Yeah. And to go back to a point you made earlier, I'm, I mean, one of the reasons Wikipedia worked is because people had the model of an encyclopedia already. Like you said, people don't always know what they want, but they knew what an encyclopedia was, and they knew how to recreate a version of it online. Um, recreating something entirely novel um, is much, much harder hmm. because like you said, um, Oh, and both of you said you, people always don't don't know what they want or what could be. Right. Um, and Facebook kind of grew, you know, in 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 ways that you know were very different from the original form of it, which was really more of like a yearbook, like a mm -hmm. picture book, um, than what it is today. The, I think uh, 
so, so something I, I've noticed, so I've been, I like to create things. So either mm -hmm. projects or websites or coding stuff or writing or videos and things like that. And something I've realized is that uh, there's an there's an important aspect of starting very localized mm -hmm. because you kind of count in, counter intuitively that could be the way how you actually get more successful or, or mm -hmm. bigger whatever you want to say uh, you know like you mentioned you know Facebook you know like what started as a yearbook or as a way to write people ended up becoming that big thing but uh, like it, it's 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 not it's not uh, obvious that if Facebook wanted to start as a you know the way how people start communicating communicating with each other i don't think he would have actually uh gotten to that point uh of actually becoming the big thing but i think that, that we were talking to an statistics professor mm -hmm. about climate change and stuff like that and, and the big thing that she said was you know climate change is a global problem but a local solution mm -hmm. which goes back to what you were saying that if you were to create a social media it would be it'd be hyper localized and perhaps a way how you can change that is that, you know, people like that, that is the, the local aspect. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps people can just have their own, you know, in the same website, but each person has their, you know, because you live here, you would have only the Urbana Champagne, but because someone who lives in Boston would have only the Boston one. And that's how perhaps the business model mm -hmm. would work. But I also think it's important to have lots of different local communities, not just one. Right. Um, and this is something that, um, I, mean, I don't know if it's because we we reward scale that we seem to be focusing on that. Um, I mean, definitely from a monetary perspective, you know, the more users you have, um, you know, the more money you make. Um, but if you look at like our power grid, a lot of that is more localized. Um, but communities can help each other. Like if one community is low on power, there's a power outage, you, you can... There's ways to communicate, whether it be for sharing or for for other reasons. Um, but having like one big centralized model, um, you know, has pros and cons. Um, Mastodon is very decentralized compared to some of the systems we have today, and that has pros and cons too. Um, it's um, you know it's taken off more because of some recent events, um, but it's it's hard to see how it. Um, you know, it doesn't have the advertising backing that some of the other sites have as well. And it also relies on a lot, a lot of volunteers. Um, you know, Wikipedia is a different, um, and the, the history of Wikipedia is fascinating too. Um, you know, the earlier versions of it had so many levels of editing mm -hmm. um, to the point where I think in the first year, um, they had less content than they had in like the current version of Wikipedia that they had in two months. Um, I would have to go back and look at the actual numbers, but they slowly started removing the levels of checking that you had. And once they did that, you know, it exploded. Um, and you see that in a lot of social media spaces, for example, like YouTube was first about, let's get as many people on here as we can, and then worry about some of the things that maybe we should be worried about. Hmm. Um, and so people, people prioritize, you know, getting, um, a critical mass of people on the space and then worry about some of the other things. Um, and that, that's that been a common pattern that we've seen in Silicon Valley and elsewhere um, in designing tools. And now we're at that point where, you know, we've had regulation in place that, you know, where the, the platform wasn't responsible, for example, for content on the site. But now we've hit this this critical point where we st we have to start thinking about what to do about some of the content that's on these sites. Hmm. Um, and they're not easy problems. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, polarization earlier. Um, and you also mentioned, um, you know, some forms of um, possible misinformation happening in these spaces. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, misinformation happened before, but it's happening now at a speed and scale that is unprecedented. Right. Um, and a lot of it is happening because it's in some of these localized groups. Um, there's this wonderful researcher at UW. Her name is Kate Starbird. Um, she and others have done work um, showing how how um, some of these platforms changed some of the policies around retweeting, like helped um, curtail some of this misinformation. Um, for example, um, 
depending on on certain content, you couldn't retweet it, but mm -hmm. you could quote retweet it. Um, and a lot of these, you know, different policies affect the reach and the speed that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some controls that people can make, um, but it's 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 hard, right? It's hard, and it's hard to do it objectively. Um, and you're gonna make mistakes, and maybe, you know, people should own up to the mistakes and learn from them and, and fix it the next time. But, you know, we shouldn't try to stop fixing these, um, stop fixing some of these problems. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a growing space. Some people actually want to treat social media as a utility the way they treat the power companies. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's regulation in place for that. Um, Interesting. Yeah, regulation. I mean, isn't a magic bullet either, though, right? Um, finding the right regulation is is key. Um, and there's so many obstacles to getting some regulations in place. Um, but we have to know what 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 levers we can start experimenting with, um, and and seeing will work. And we need evidence based practice, right? Like we need concrete um, studies that show. Um, what works and what doesn't work. Mm. So, so far we've been talking about the micro level of something mm -hmm. perhaps much bigger. So the macro level, uh, have you read the little bit out there, but have you read the November Manifesto? I have not. I have but, not. Uh, well, a little out there, but so the, the conclusion is mm -hmm. obviously flawed, same way that perhaps Karl Marx uh, mm -hmm. was flawed. But uh, the thought process that these people had is is interesting to understand. So okay. the thesis of perhaps the, the, the November Manifesto is that uh, the reason why, you know, technology and like we should not have technology is that it creates this uh, people to be, you know, depressed and anxious and not be as happy. And it creates what you said um, earlier with the example of the living community is that people lose the sense of power. So in, in this manifesto that he writes, he, he writes the power process where, where he writes, you know, the reason why some people feel more satisfied than others is that they have the pursuit of fulfillment, which is this idea that you have a goal, mm -hmm. you can put some effort into it and you can, you know, it's not certain that you can actually get it, but if you do serious effort, you will get that thing. And the thing is that with uh, our modern society with technology, he says that we've lost that type of power where... Mm -hmm. It's either, it's really easy, like we can get food pretty easily, we can, you know, go work easily, or we have the, you know, the other type of power, which is insanely hard to do anything. It's mm -hmm. insanely hard to get a job, it's insanely hard to, you know, get a partner, it's insanely hard to have a family, which creates uh, feelings of inferiority and depression and all of this. Long thing, uh, long explanation, but um, I I'm, I'm wondering how you you see that, that sort of a power like, how can we, like, because the, the problem fundamentally is about power, mm -hmm. that people have less power because of technology. Some people find the artificial ways to, to do power. So, for instance, he says that, you know, scientists, uh, you know, they, they find these problems and that's how they, they, they find fulfillment because that's how they, they are able to go through the power process. Mm -hmm. So, one solution that he says is that, you know, how can we give more people or meaning that like we've we've been thinking a lot about these questions and recently is that people have lost meaning. Young people, mm -hmm. people in the past, perhaps in in your generation, was you, they would they would have their midlife crisis when they were fifty. Our generation, they're having it our age, mm -hmm. if in, in college. So, do you have any thoughts on how to give meaning or people how to or how to create yeah. ways to give yeah. people feel power? Well, I think I mean going back. You know, forgive me for keep going going back to this point, but this idea of having stronger community connections helps give you meaning, like having people with shared goals and shared values and having more than one community, um, like having one Instagram community, like one, I mean, people felt the need for something outside of Instagram, so they created their FinSTEC accounts. Um, you know, this idea where they can actually be a bit more raw in spaces, like they were f trying to find community by creating these FinSTEC accounts instead of just the regular Instagram What's, where, what's a Finsta? A Finsta is, it's a different type of Instagram account, but you invite yeah. way fewer people and your photos are like typically less polished and you talk about things that you wouldn't talk to the public about. So people felt this, the theory is that people felt this like 
intense need to be so perfect on Instagram and have everything be so polished. Right. But but on Finsta, you know, you can have a smaller group of friends, something where you can have a, a different type of connection to. Um, there's this new social media, um, um, you know, phenomenon happening now. I think it's called Be Real. Be Real. Um, Number one app. Yeah, year, yeah, right? yeah. And so the idea there is about, you know, don't worry so much about, you know, like the polish, um, because that, that that could add a lot of anxiety. Um, you know, looking at the lights in this space, you know, some people do that for every Instagram photo. Um, but this idea of forming connections and multiple connections with multiple communities, um, I think is something that we need to go back to. Um, you know, Urbana Champagne, actually, I think is a fascinating place to be right now because, you know, you can meet with a local mayor here. You can go to a town hall and meet the leaders. Like you can go to, you know, some of the schools meetings and you can talk to the people that make these decisions and you can volunteer to be, you know, parts of these groups. I think one of the things that we need to do is remind people that they can do all of these things. Um, what we don't want is this feeling of learned helplessness that a lot of people are feeling on social media. A lot of people are feeling, um, possibly also because they work 16 hour days and are exhausted. You know, if you're a single parent, you work 16 hours a day, you don't have time to go to a town hall. You don't have time to go to a bunch of these meetings. Um, so is there some other way to, you know, reach out to local leadership, you know, to have a voice, um, but I do think that that civic leaders and city organizers need to provide more outputs to the citizens in their spaces mm. and allow for opportunities for people to feel more empowered. And not just feel more empowered, but to be empowered. Um, and if somebody, you know, is a is a single parent um, and they want a voice, like I was really happy when, you know, at least the university made um, said that, you know, voting day, you know, people have off, they're going to go vote. I mean, that was a decision made to empower people. And I think that was a decision made in the right direction. Um, and that wasn't a decision that, with, that involved technology. It was a decision that involved people um, and let them go and do something that, you know, gave them a voice. Um, I think we don't want to forget that we have power as humans. Um, and we need to... Uh, you know, it goes back to awareness. Like, what can I do? Um, you know, what, um, what, um, you know, what opportunities exist there, exist there for folks. And I think one of the challenges, I mean, if you look at, if you look at sort of like the, the income disparity in certain places, um, you know, that, that is growing and maybe when a city sees that you know they need to step in and have more of these events or more of these opportunities for people to um you know be able to have a voice usually creating a company is a way to do these things as a way to make these things happen as a way to align the incentives in order to make these type of things happening have you thought about starting a company or anything like that um well i think that a lot of what i'm interested in would probably be more of a nonprofit. So, for example, like I would love to have an initiative where I could audit algorithms, where, you know, like minded people could come together and um, maybe donate some of their data, um, you know, anonymized in some way, but with some demographics where we can see if algorithms might be discriminating against some people mm. or not. Um, and we've been talking to lots of different people about this idea. Um, we've built lots of social media sites and people, somebody offered us $40 million to operationalize it. Um, and this was a site that basically helped you. It was a Twitter client and this was in 2010. People also offered us money when we built a site that helped you figure out based on what people were saying online, how the stock market was going to go. Um, I um, didn't want to start a hedge fund. Um, I also, I have to say as a, as, an, as a researcher, I often get more excited building version 1.0 of something mm. than version you know, 10.0 of something. Um, but 
you know, one of the things that, that with the community of people, I hope to get off the ground, um, and again, this is going to involve a lot of people, um, is a way to be able to audit certain infrastructures mm -hmm. um, so that we can get a sense of what is happening because the way things are built today and with certain terms of service, um, it's hard to it's hard to figure out what's happening. And I also never expected, you know, when I started as faculty here to be able to get some of this data. So we've been doing lots of audits, which is why I'm really passionate about this. Um, we actually sued the US government right. um, to be able to, to feel more comfortable doing some of these audits. Um, and we shouldn't have to do that. And so getting a coalition of people together working on this common theme to make it a norm and hopefully some form of, you know, maybe even a nonprofit um, or maybe a series of nonprofits um, might be helpful. Um, we have like the USDA, for example, that inspects um, our food. We have the FDA that inspects our drugs. Um, why not something that inspects our technologies and sees if they're harmful to us and figure out, um, you know, a, a workflow for that and figure out um, how to do it in such a way where we can still have a flourishing economy and um, there can be some, you know, intellectual property for people to benefit from given the amount of time and energy they put into creating it, but also um, determining whether or not um, it harms people. How do you see AI playing a role in all of this in the, in the coming years? So I'm, you know, I'm excited about AI. Um, I also, you know, have no idea where it's going to take us. Um, there are certain things about it that, um, you know, when, when I was in school and I took AI courses, we didn't talk about machine learning. We didn't talk about deep learning. Uh, we talked about like common sense reasoning. Um, we talked about logic. Um, and so again, going back to like scale, um, a lot of what we see today is because of the scale of data, right. you know, that, that is available. Um, I was playing with uh, GPT-3, <laughs> you know, with my son the other day and, um, you know, he put his homework in there <laughs> and like, it's like write a book report for this book. And, um, it wasn't bad. And then I, you know, he put in some word problems in math and it got, it got, you know, at least one of them right. I asked it to write an academic bio for myself because I hate writing bios. Um, it made me sound better than I was. Um, and it also made a mistake that I went to Berkeley when I didn't go to Berkeley. Um, you know, somebody in our department um, asked it, like we write, this is this time of year where we write lots of recommendation letters for students. <laughs> right. And so he wrote, he says, write me a letter of recommendation for a student who got an A in my class, but who I don't remember. And he wrote a pretty good letter. Um, it wasn't bad. <laughs> um, and so 10 years ago, I would not like, we, we all talked about stuff like this. You know, we've all seen 2001, um, but actually playing with it. Um, I have different thoughts than I imagined I would have. Mm. Like my first thoughts playing with it were like, wow, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to train GPT-3. Um, what is the carbon footprint of it? Mm. Like, I didn't think I would be thinking about that 10 years ago. Um, but that's something I think about now. Um, like, do I need, like, what problems is this going to solve? Like, do I need it at the expense of this carbon Computational power? Yeah. Power. And so I've been thinking a lot about these, like, going back macro, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious about what types of metrics we use to show the values that we care about in society. Mm. Like you mentioned earlier, like, um, advertising and shareholders, um, like we often use GDP as a measure, but GDP is additive, right? You, you can't take something away from it. Um, and so we can't like, we can't have a, we don't have like GDP doesn't capture the carbon, the damage we do from you know, using these technologies. Um, and so I would like to see like a, a metric that captures that in a reasonably good way. You know, no metric is perfect. And there's many arguments for why we haven't 
from having enough metrics and maybe not needing any more. But, um, but I am excited about AI, especially in some of the medical applications that I see. Mm. I'm excited that people care about bias, are investigating, you know, possible side effects of bias mm. in AI algorithms. Um, I think it's important for us to keep being critical of it as we develop it. Um, and I also think it's going to be hard to stop some things from being developed. Like sometimes there's just this momentum. And like you said, it's happening so much faster than regulators um, can manage it. Like I forget what the average age of Congress was, but it was not 20. It's not uh, 50 either. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, like some some of the, the work that I've seen in health and AI, you know, seems really, really promising. Um, the work that I've seen in speech recognition, mm -hmm. you know, has been fascinating, um, especially when I see some of these tools helping people that, um, you know, helping people communicate when they couldn't before. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic, but I also think it's very, very important that we, that we protect people in the process and that people have certain rights. So I'm really excited by some of the work Alondra Nelson is doing in the government. Um, she's the head of OSTP and she's trying to get together a bill of rights that people have around AI similar to the way we have a Bill of Rights, you know, in the Constitution hmm. to what we're entitled to. Um, she wants to put out a Bill of Rights for what we're entitled to when AI is in our lives. Hmm. And I think that's something that we, um, that if we can do correctly, and I hope that people, you know, jump on board, um, will help us think about what we need to you know, not lose some of our agency and power, um, especially around like the, the data being collected around us all the time. Like, I mean, what does that mean? Um, you know, what does it mean when, you know, our DNA gets collected? What is it like, especially during COVID, you know, so many saliva tests and yeah. And like HIPAA was violated left and right. And sometimes the argument for that was that it's an emergency. It's okay to ignore HIPAA for this. Hmm. Um, but lots of, you know, we've seen lots of mistakes being made. Right. Um, and some companies had record breaking fines for violating some of these, mis for some of these rules and mm -hmm. for making mistakes. But one of the things that I do know that the mistakes are not going to stop happening. And so we need to have, you know, some, some path in place to figure out what to do when a mistake is made because they, they are going to keep happening. Um, and how to learn from it and make sure this doesn't happen again. Hmm. Um, like whenever you do anything new, the unexpected is going to happen. Um, but I also know that people are very adaptable. Um, and I do think that people are going to find also new ways to communicate. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how communication evolves, right? Like historically we communicated with real people. Um, so it's one thing I worry, I, I wonder about and sometimes worry about, right. um, um, like you mentioned the Turing test earlier too. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, in this world of AI, we're going to be having, you know, discussions about, you know, what does a Turing test even mean anymore mm -hmm. and what does it tell us? And is that even, you know, something meaningful that we need to worry about? Um, but I am optimistic about AI. And I've seen cases where it's been super helpful. And I'm trying to make, make a list of places where it's been helpful because in the news you often hear about, you know, the, the not so great cases around it. Um, and I'm wondering if it can be used um, in ways that I haven't even thought about yet. And I'm sure it will be. Something that I think about um, with tools like GPT-3 that you mentioned is, mm -hmm. is it more important to know how to use a tool or how to make a tool like G with gpt3 as you mentioned like your your son he like he put in problems and they just spit out the answers right you're yeah. not you're not really learning how to do it yourself but you you know how to use a tool that can do it for you mm -hmm. that that applies in a lot of things like the reason why we make tools is to make the job easier mm -hmm. right and it prevents you from 
having to go into the nitty gritty of things to to get to where you want. So, in your opinion, um, do you think it's more important as a human civilization or like going forward? Is it is it going to be more important to know how to make a tool or how to master using a tool? I think as with most questions like that, the answer is it depends. And one of the things I think it depends on is whether or not it affects people. So, for example, my car is a tool. Right. Um, my car gets me from point A to point B. I can do some minor tweaks in my car, but I can't build a car mm -hmm. and I don't need to build a car. Um, but what matters is that I have a mental model for how it works and it's consistent. So I know if I press the gas pedal, it's going to do this. If I press the brake, it's going to do that. Right. Um, I don't have that same consistent mental model for Facebook. Like one day, if I like something, mm -hmm. I might see more of that thing. The next day, if I like something, you know, maybe something entirely different is going to happen. Um, and so I think what we do need, um, we, it's, I don't think anybody should have to have the responsibility of building everything because it's too overwhelming and not everybody wants to do it. Right. Um, but what we do need for some of these AI based tools is the ability to form these mental models to know what to expect and know how to use them. Like more transparency between. So transparency is one way, but it's not the only way. And transparency also backfires. Mm. So oftentimes people use transparency. It's like once we have that, everything is solved. It doesn't solve everything because you can have transparency and see 700 variables that go into making something and that's not going to help you at all. Um, but the idea of, of seeing something that, you know, that leaks, that mm. gives you an idea. So like one example, we made a bunch of narrative interfaces on top of Facebook where people could explore. Um, so for one interface showed you, you know, what everything posted and what you saw. And so for the first time in their lives, like most of the people were like, wait a second, I am not seeing everything all of my friends post. And then they were like, well, why didn't I see that post? And I wish I had seen that post. And we also noticed that people, like one person was like, oh my God. They were like, I got so mad at this friend because she didn't reply to my message about my grandmother dying. And I just was convinced she saw it, but now maybe she didn't see it. And I like ruined a friendship over this. Mm. So having some of these tools that offer a reveal into some, not at everything, so people can still can maintain intellectual property, right. but offering, offering a reveal into what is happening or some possible outcomes. Like if I do this, this happens. But if I do that, that happens. Where people can start forming these mental models, I think is key. Um, because it's easy to make a mental model for what happens with your car because it is so consistent. Um, and so in terms of programming, um, I do think that slowly, I do think that programming and building things like that is going to become a literacy similar to the way that writing and arithmetic have become core literacies. Right. I do think that computing in some form or other is going to become a form of literacy. And I do think it's important that people have a sense of it, but I don't think people have to create like super, super complex things, mm. but I do think people need to have the literacy to understand them. And another way to ask the question is that, um, two ways, is that the way is that, is it even worth, uh, I guess maybe it's, that's a uh, wrong framing, but uh, so the, 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 the other way to see it would be your kid, for instance, your mm -hmm. son is going through middle school. Mm -hmm. in high school in college and he's going to go through all of this and he's going to go he's going to have to go to write essays and and, mm -hmm. and things and write math problems and and like at that point when, when we have the tools that you could do it for us and we could be focusing on on what we're actually good at uh which another which is another point that i want to get at is that you know lick lighter wrote this thing a uh, human computer uh, interface have you read that thing i have not read that one have you, have you heard of the name which, what is the person's uh, first Lighter, name? JCR Licklighter. I don't think I've read that. Uh, he was at MIT. Uh, he was a very interesting person. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, so the, he, what he was saying is that he wrote these papers that at mm -hmm. some point, uh, all the, th the thinking, the computing will be done by, by a machine. Mm -hmm. And us, the humans, will be f focusing on the judgment. Mm -hmm. So is it even worth for your son to you know, go to middle school and be writing essays or, and doing these things uh, when he can be perhaps focusing on what the future human would do. Yeah, I um, totally think it's important. One, I mean, he needs to develop social skills. 
I think it's important to build a social network and to learn about collaborative learning and to throw ideas off other people and to grow that way. I think that's super important. Um, I also think it's much easier to critique than create. And so, yeah, you can have things creating for you, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't be creating yourself as well. Um, I think, like, I critique so much, but it's so much harder to create. But when I do create, in many ways, that's my research. Sometimes, my like, as I write, I get these new ideas that I don't get just from critiquing existing work. So for me, writing is a research process. It's a way of generating new ideas. Um, and while it's hard for me, I'm not going to lie, I don't want to give that up because it's one of my tools in my toolbox for, for doing what I do and for helping me to come up with new ideas. Um, and so, yeah, I, I also think that while we have, like, you can ask GPT-3 to tell you the rules of soccer in a haiku and write poetry for you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still interesting to see what humans write with respect to poetry. And it's also important to remember that, at least for now, a lot of machine learning algorithms, you know, take what's out there and synthesize something from it. Um, you know, even if, like, you ask it something more recent, G GPT-3 will tell you, like, if it's after 2021, I'm sorry, I can't right. do anything. It's not in my model. Yeah. And so um, we still don't know yet the limitations. There's still many, many debates about what is intelligence, mm -hmm. about what it can do. Is it reasoning? Is it not? Um, but there are things that happen in our brain when we write um, that help us grow. Um, and interestingly enough, there are also studies that show that because we use GPS a lot, there's certain parts of our brain that are shrinking. Mm. And so it's, I'm, I'm wondering how it is going to change us in some ways. Um, just to bring out some other analogies, um, I, I do think the social thing is important, but I love my washing machine, um, especially because it's so cold in Urbana in the winter. Um, so maybe once upon a time, people would go to like some lake and wash clothes together and talk and gossip, and that was great. Um, um, so I wouldn't mind some extra time, like some water cooler time when talking to people, um, but I do like my washing machine. And so this this debate about whether or not this frees up time for you to do other things is ongoing. It's happened with the car, with the washing machine, with the typewriter, with the word processor. Um, and people people keep finding creative new things to do. Um, and I do think it's going to make something simpler. But I think for, for me, I would still want to be able to write, even if, you know, GPT-3 could do awesome things. I wouldn't mind if it made my CV for me, so I wouldn't have to update it all the time um, with certain, you know, things that are that are more rote. Um, but for certain like creative tasks, um, I think people would miss writing if they couldn't do it, or if they were told not to do it. That that's the other thing, right? Your your dependence on tools also have implications. Like it goes both ways. And that that's pretty interesting to think about. And I think what I'm, I think what you're trying to say is like you can, there's still a human aspect to what we do and what we like doing. And sure, you can, you can, there are ways to automate that, but some things need to be done the way that we want it to. And I think the way these tools can help us is to get rid of those tasks that might be cumbersome or don't involve much creative thinking so that we can focus on those creative thinking parts. I yeah. think that's what he was trying to that's also get That's kind of what we've done like with assembly line. And I can also imagine using tools like, I mean, I go to Instagram sometimes, I go to Pinterest to get like ideas if I'm designing something. Mm -hmm. I can imagine sort of like a back and forth, um, getting ideas from some automated tool like that, you know, to help in, in some of my processes and like in creating these new, you know, human, you know, AI dialogues um, that could be really interesting. Um, and I'm really interested in tools that would help you steer things in one way or another. Um, but I, yeah, I, I do see possibilities there. Yeah, uh, as a, you know, let's say if I, if I went back to or high school, middle school, I, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting future ahead because you grow up with these tools where you don't. Yeah. So it, it's sort of, you know, I always said that, you know, the internet, it, it was gonna create a, a huge, inequality because it's going to get uh, create ultra you know smart people like ultra you know 
hardworking people, like people will be 12 years old and will, have, will know as much physics as a PhD or a professor, but it will also create this ultra deprived like learning people that will use these tools as a, not, to not, not do the homework so they could watch Netflix, while someone will just use everything, these tools to just get out of school and then just be focusing on becoming, you know, creating new tools and things like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I mean, right now, I'm I'm actually very concerned about the inequity in broadband access, mm. like who has access and who does not, um, like who has access to information, like you mentioned. Um, like that is something that I think we do need to make more people have access, um, especially because it provides like knowledge about like town halls that we talked about earlier. It allows for communication. Um, now, I remember when I was really little, um, you know, my, my, my parents were both born in Greece. I was born here. Um, but we would go back and, um, we went back for a significant amount of time while my father was still here. And I remember in the U S almost everyone, you had a phone. Right. And back there, like people didn't have phones. It was like four fifth mountains and there was one tavern that had a phone and I would go there like, you know, every Sunday and I would, um, you know, wait for a phone call from my dad. And it was a big deal to be able to talk to him. He would just be screaming into the phone because like the technology was very different. Um, and also like many people would come knowing that I would be there to listen to my half of the conversation. Yeah. And so sometimes like I would, after that, I would go and play. And by the time I got home, my mom already knew what we talked about because people had told her. Wow. <laughs> and then, um, and then my grandfather got a phone. He got one of the first phones in the village. And then, like, we discovered that what's the point if there's nobody, like, nobody else has one. Who are we going to talk to? So his house became like a lobby for people waiting for calls from the U.S. And so it was, it was kind of fun. It was kind of social. But this idea being that, like, and, and there was this inequity, right? Like, he had a phone. Other people, other people didn't. Um, and it was still hard to put phones in place uh, because of all the mountains. But then when cell phone technology came around, mm -hmm it became easier for more people to have a phone. Um, and so, you know, right now, like we, we saw that happening like in Ukraine recently, you know, with, you know, communication system down and, and some of the challenges you face when you don't have communications. And then we saw Starlink go in. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have like one person having the power to give all of these people like information. I mean, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, but who has it and who does it and who gets to control who has it and who does it, like you said, is going to create some really interesting dynamics. And hopefully we can, hopefully we can, you know, prioritize, you know, access to everybody. What are some of your favorite memories from, you know, going back to Greece and, 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 and having, have grown up in that, you know, Greek, you know, culture and Greek family and, Maybe how that helps you see the world differently. Oh, I mean, I think a lot of what um, what I I miss from that is like, you know, sitting down with my grandmother and family, like even just making noodles and all like the discussions you have while doing that. Or my family had a tobacco farm, and then after you pick the tobacco, everyone has to, you know, put it through the needle, and like that was like a, a like a big bonding time. Um, so I miss activities like that where you you bond by storytelling. So I, I wish there were more activities we do today with storytelling. Like, I think that's becoming a lost art. Even like when people like read a coffee cup and like, like pretend to read your fortune, like a really good person doing that will be able to see these like micro expressions on your face mm -hmm. and know what, what you're anxious about and like tell a story that engages you or freaks you out because of that. But um, I think some of these, you know, connections that you can form um, in those activities, I miss a lot. Um, I also think that, you know, I was lucky in a way to get to see, you know, a rural area there and like live, you know, in the city in Chicago and compare and contrast just how things are done. Like having multiple perspectives, I think helped me a lot in my work. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I study communication is because I'm so intrigued by the different types of communication, like in how some forms of communication were different there than here. Um, and I struggled with communication here and I, I had an accent. 
um, even though I was born here because I was raised by my grandmother and, and went to like a Greek school early on. Um, but looking at these differences in culture, um, to me, it's, just, it's, it's still fascinating. Um, and I wish I could go back more often. Um, but, but it's, um, and I'm also glad that there's technology and I can talk to my family there, even though they're so far away. And I can talk to them every day now without screaming. <laughs> and, you know, if I talk to them using Viber, you know, I don't have that, like, especially for, for folks in certain rural areas, the cost isn't as prohibitive once you have, you know, Wi-Fi. Mm. So that part of it is, is really nice. So like, it's nice being able to, to remember sort of like those local, those local experiences, but also try to recreate some of them, mm. you know, even at a distance. How often do you go back now? Um, COVID changed things quite a bit. You know, we try to go back, you know, in the summers, but didn't go back as frequently during COVID. Right. Um, so hopefully we'll go this summer. Oh, nice. Yeah. Do your, uh, do you, I mean, I, I don't know how many children you have, but like, do your children uh, like going back? Like, what do they think? Oh, of my son is upset we're not going for Christmas. He, yeah, he loves going back. You know, he's got his grandmother there. Wow. Um, he, you know, I think it's also, you know, fun for him to, you know, just see some of it, the family members that he has there. And there's beaches and ice cream and it's no, there's no school in the summer. So you associate all of that stuff with, right. with um, like the no schoolness with the place. But... But yeah, like the, the connectivity, I think, is um, is very different. Like I, I, I rem my parents told me that when they wanted, they met in the U.S. when they wanted to get married, um, like they didn't know how to use the existing communication channels to keep the norms. Like technically, my father was supposed to ask for my mother's hand, but he couldn't be there to do it, so he wrote a letter to do it. And so it's interesting how we, you know, adapt what we have for. Um, for what we used to do. Right. Like even during the pandemic, you can you can still see videos of like people getting married over Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> and people did it over the telegraph yeah. too. And so like it's like there's certain things that we just want to do. Like we want to communicate, you know, we want to be close to people. Um, we want to form connections and you, and there was misinformation with the telegraph. There was like cheating and gambling with the telegraph. Um, there's certain things that just seem to happen right and um but people do want to connect what was your parents reactions when he once they got the letter i don't know i don't know yeah, I, i'd be curious because in a, in a way the medium becomes a message because it, it's, it's not the same thing as you know him yeah yeah hey, yeah you know. yeah you know i almost wish i'd asked all those questions earlier you know when i could but um But yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's interesting to me. Like I, I imagine that, you know, when my son grows up, the job he eventually has may not even exist today. Mm. Um, I mean, when I started, when I started school undergrad as a freshman, you know, we had web browsers, um, but they were like text-based web browsers that you used like in a terminal window. Right. Um, most of them. So there was another one, I think, that had images like all at the end. But when Mosaic came out, and they actually came out here at the NCSA, and that had images that were inline. So, I mean, it wasn't the first browser, but it was the first browser with inline photos. Mm -hmm. um, overnight, that changed the entire campus. Um, so that was like an interesting game changer. And that actually helped get people on the web, uh, on the internet, um, that probably wouldn't have been on it before. Um, and you had, you know, issues of access there as well. Mm. Um, and now more people hopefully, you know, have some form of access. Um, but it's like, the reason I bring up that example is I didn't expect that to happen when I was a freshman. Um, and so I think there are going to be a lot of unexpected things ahead of us. And we're going to have to learn to adapt and not be scared up front, um, but to also have, you know, safety checks in place. Something that we have thought about um, like for a while now is how... Oh, sorry. The, 
how the current education systems need to change just to make room for these possibilities and just have a broader range and like more bandwidth for all these ki different kinds of people that are in the system right now and how like it's a, it's a scary thought that if you if you're that the job that you might not like might end up working on doesn't exist right now but you're still choosing a major you're still choosing your line yeah, of study thinking yeah, yeah. that that'll be your future yeah so like in a way you're like narrowing your vision even though you do not know what's at the end of the tunnel like you yeah. you, you you need to have that broad context perspective but. yeah well i think that's one of, i hope that's a space that universities can go to and allow for more interdiscipl interdisciplinarity and not have silos in departments or disciplines like there was a time when you could be a philosopher and you know you could do medicine and philosophy and you know poetry and that was the norm um and then people started to specialize a little bit more right um like i didn't like i could not have predicted in you know the early 90s that the job of social media influencer would exist um or like a professional gamer yeah example. or a professional gamer like um you know, in, in retrospect, you know, it's kind of obvious, but it's always easy to see in hindsight, right? Right. Um, but, yeah, there's going to be, like, professions that that did not exist. And even professions that we do know are going to change drastically. Like, if if I'm a lawyer or a doctor and I have a tool that helps me, you know, find, you know, a case that might help me or that forms the argument for me, mm -hmm. or if I'm, a, like, a doctor and... And I don't have to do the searching anymore. Like, do I have to memorize in medical school? Like, how does that change the profession? Um, it's going to significantly change some disciplines over time. Um, and we have, you know, algorithms right now. I think somebody performed one of the first, um, you know, I don't know, it wasn't, I can't really call it a movie. It was pretty short, but um, it was written by, you know, an algorithm, like all of the 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 dialogue was written by an algorithm right and at this university we had the first ever you know piece of music composed by a computer mm -hmm. um and you know that said we still we haven't seen that much of that since right mm -hmm. like it, it happened here it happened pretty early on um there hasn't been that big ev of a um revolution in that space but maybe maybe it'll happen now um we have seen art generated by, you know, open AI type um, tools. And we have seen people furious mm. that they've won contests over humans. Right. Um, so seeing that dynamic play out is going to be interesting too. And also who gets credit? Um, like, do you give open AI, you know, credit for, you know, writing a, a paper with you? Mm. Are they a co-author? Um, Back, uh, back propagation is the the winner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's uh, remains to be seen. Yeah. We should ask uh, GPT three if it wants to be credited. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. um, it's you know, it's there. And there's going to be lots of similar, you know, lots of many similar tools to it. Right. Um, it's like one thing I think about is that perhaps freshmen or even sophomores in computer science, for instance, which you know, a lot of them they think they're gonna. You know, get the job and you're gonna be happy and rich and successful uh, it's it's you know in the next two years i just don't know how many people will need that many programmers because in you know usually you know in most fields uh like a lot of the engineering like that many like companies don't need that many mechanical engineering companies don't, don't need that mm -hmm. many of x engineering but uh in the, until now people need a lot of computer science and programmers and things like this but we have tools that could you know, if you give it a, a tool like AI to a programmer, you could do as, you know, you could you know, 10x this engineer. So are you going to need that many people? So that that will change, you know. Yeah, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. There's been times in the past when we've said we don't need any more programmers and it turns out we did. Right. So some of these things are just so hard to predict. Um, yeah, it's... Um, like even even in the field of CS, like I've seen I've seen years where you know we've had fluctuations in terms of you know who applies, and sometimes people don't come because they go to the startup world. Sometimes they don't come because they go to um, you know industry. 
um, you know, sometimes they go on to the next new thing, whatever that might be. Um, but we still have writers and we still have mathematicians. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, I don't think computing is going anywhere. Um, I think to your point, I think what you're referring to is, you know, will an algorithm be able to write a program so we don't need a person to do it? Um, and I think that's still like unclear at the moment. Uh, you think so? Like, have you seen the, well, perhaps not the latest of the R algorithm, but a lot of the things that a programmer might be, be doing in, in their day-to-day -day, like job? So I think that, I mean, there are signs that we have algorithms creating programs, um, but there are still decisions to be made about what to program and how to do it and how to do it best. And the discussions around this, you know, like, Having been, having worked inside of several companies, um, there's a huge social component to programming and it's not just a technical, it's not just a technical problem. Right. Which is the, the judgment part of it, like making decisions, which you don't necessarily learn if you study computer science. Yes, yeah, some of the values, but also understanding some of the consequences right. that may not be in a data repository that a machine learning algorithm might use. If you had to create a major about a uh, human computer interaction what classes what type of things would you add oh wow so i actually wish i wish we taught probability in the second grade so i would um i do think people need to be proficient in uh, like applied machine learning techniques so i would hope that they would understand probability um applied machine learning i think design is critical as a communication medium but also to help people um to help people um, use interfaces properly. Like I, I ordered a tea from a kiosk the other day and the interface like was so confusing, I got the opposite of what I wanted. <laughs> um, I would also hope that people would take um, some classes on econ. Like I think game theory is fascinating in this space. Mm. Um, I would hope that people would be able to program. Um, I also think that people need to understand some forms of you know, psychology, sociology, research methods. I mean, how to formulate a good research question. And I really wish we paid more, like I don't think as undergrads we give people enough experience in critical thinking. So I do think that we need to help students think about what we should do, what we shouldn't do, why, um, and to include that in their in their process of creating. Like I think I think that's one of the biggest things that's lacking right now. And as I see students enter, you know, doctoral programs and master's programs from undergrad, that's one of the hardest things for them to pick up because it hasn't been emphasized at all in their undergrad education. So I want to see more of that. I think design, like art and design classes, help you do that a lot. And so I, I think we need more art and design in CS. It's like um, Steve Jobs, like he did calligraphy, right, in, in his college. And yeah, yeah, like, he talks a lot about typeface too. You're right, you're right. That inspired a lot of what came out in the Macintosh because he, yeah, that's yeah, why yeah. He, he understood the importance and the, like, that's he was putting so much emphasis on why he wanted it to be perfect. And yeah, and there's so many artists out there, like, like speculative artists that even think about technology, they're way ahead of many computer scientists. Um, yeah, so keeping your eye on what's happening in the art world um, is super helpful because they really try to, you know, get people to think about what could be, what is, um, and just to, to think differently. Yeah, I took an art history class mm -hmm. just for fun, just to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and it's exactly what you're saying. Just seeing these things, how they actually affect people and the ramification and, and what it is, just objectively, like what, what it is. And it's a whole different world that who knows how that would affect how I see things in the future. But I think... Uh, yeah, there's an important aspect of just, you know, it's it's fine if you, you know, like there's a point where okay, like you need to know the algorithms and, and you know how Java works and C plus plus and all these things and, but, in the future there'll be a lot more, having this type of judgment and, and seeing how how things interact and the consequences and having this type of thinking, perhaps well, well the opportunity will be. Yeah, and maybe like one of the things that we need to do is try to figure out, like, have processes and methods for maybe figuring out some of these consequences 
sooner. Um, like that would be an interesting research space to look at. Um, a hard one, don't get me wrong, but you know, because we know that these con like we're going to have negative consequences to the extent that we could figure out what they might be and, you know, either maybe not even go somewhere if we think that's going to happen, um, could be helpful. If you had to, if you had to teach a class on like design or like, what would you focus on? Um, so I actually do teach a class that's very design based. So it's a CS class. It's very studio based and it's called social visualization. Um, and it, it kind of, it has a basic theme, but it's about telling stories with data and more and more people are telling sort of like machine learning stories. Um, and so I love teaching that class because it involves a lot of design work and how you communicate something visually. Um, I also think it's interesting because, um, right now on Reddit and on Twitter and many sites, like people just show visualizations with a title and like no context, nothing mm. else. When historically a bunch of these visualizations were usually part of an article or were part of a presentation. And so, um, in this class, we do a little bit of um, learning about metaphors, um, learning about design, color, typeface, um, learning about statistics and probability, like how you clean data, how you collect data properly without being biased, um, how to tell a story. Right. Ethics is a huge part of it. Like how do you ethically collect data and protect the people where you have data from and, and what you're collecting, is it appropriate and safe for you to show? Um, and then if what you're doing, like, is it even worth doing? Like, will it be impactful? And what type of conversation can you have and will it reach people and how can they get back to you? Right. So it's a fun class to teach. So it's a mixture of computer science, design, um, a lot of data science, ethics. Um, and I would want more of those courses. Like right now, you can't do all of that in one semester. I would love right. to sort of like tease some of them apart and maybe have a bit more on like, possibly social responsibility when you create a tool. Mm. Um, and I would like there to be more methods around community-centered design and community-centered computing. Um, and in one of the other classes that I'm co-teaching this coming spring, we actually bring in a lot of civic leaders from Urbana to come and tell us about some of the problems that they're facing and they invite students to work with them um, to design certain types of um, tools and ideas that would that they feel that they need. What's it class uh, called? It's called, um, like she kind of changes, um, Innovation Illinois or Illinois Innovation. We kind of, um, mm -hmm. and it touches on, it touches on this idea of community-centered design focusing on the history of the University of Illinois. So for example, uh, Plato, you know, one of the first like distance learning systems over a network that was designed here. Um, it addresses some of the historical context and challenges around dress. Um, so we were a school that had accommodations and degree programs um, for students with disabilities um, early on. Um, it addresses ILIAC, it addresses lots of these themes in our campus and talks about like what the context was like then when they were created, what it might be like here today and if we were to recreate some of these tools today how might they be different and how do we do it so kind of this many of the similar questions that you're asking me right now mm -hmm. we address in that class and we also try to bring in alumni to explain how um the university was different in their time <laughs> and it's it's fascinating to hear their stories it's always fun yeah yeah and then we also take a trip to the the archives on campus and you can see like in the archives, there's like a box that has a rock that somebody threw into the window of Everett during a protest during the Vietnam War. Um, so you can see that the power that students had to change what was happening on campus and how these this like power and this desire for um, representation has changed over time. Um, and just to, to tease it apart and to see if like you ask some of these students like how the school's governed Many students don't know. Many mm -hmm. students don't even know that there's a student in our board, actually two students from UIUC, um, but um, they don't understand how the university is governed. And so we try to basically look at some of these things that might be opaque and make them more visible um, and help students be proactive in their education. 
so they can feel like they have more power, so they, they have more fulfillment and, and meaning. It may be. I hadn't thought of it yeah. in that <laughs> Unabomber framing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, in one year, the students made like a big survey that they released and they wanted, you know, at the end, they, they felt that we needed better resources for mental health and transportation, mm -hmm. right. um, among other things. You know, there was also, they felt that there wasn't enough um, representation in food around all different cultures that exist on this campus. Um, and they wanted like better representation food wise, like things that you might take for like not think about. Uh, but they're like, why shouldn't there be this type of food here when there's so much of this other type of food right. here? And, and at least in terms of mental health resources, I do think that's something that, you know, we have the year of the university and hopefully, you know, more resources, more actionable resources can be put into that. Yeah, I think one pattern we've noticed is that students have become more complacent and also kind of like learn helplessness. Yes. Is that, you know, there's, a, there, there's something wrong and just like, Okay, great. Uh, we, we were on Tuesday. We had, we talked mm -hmm. to the president of the university. Uh, oh, great! Celine, and th that's one thing he said is that uh, he he sees that a lot of students are just yeah, this is how they are, and just they, they don't they don't they're not yeah. motivated to like right. or optimi optimistic about the future. And, wow! So we need to make them aware of channels that they have to get a signal back, um, and I think that the leadership here has to you know, sincerely listen, um, you know, having a, we did a recent study where with, and we found like a lot of learned helplessness because people said that it was like speaking into a void when they wanted to argue about why their content was removed from Instagram, for example. Um, so this idea of speaking into a void, like having a channel that goes to dev null isn't really that helpful, but having a channel where there can be some back and forth you know, that is helpful. Um, oh, that's saddening to hear that they felt that. Um, it's a big campus, and I think COVID has made people even more, mm -hmm. even more remote. Um, I mean, even some of the communication challenges around there about people not knowing what to do when quarantining. Right. Um, messaging is hard. Back and forth messaging is even harder. Um, but, you know, maybe that's one of the things we should prioritize. Yeah, and that like, doesn't need know, computing. Not at all. It's just information. Because, you know, like all the algorithms and the, and the, the technologies, there's people with the judgment to make things. Yeah. You know, like it, one framing is that how I looked at it is that, you know, you know, in the past, perhaps, the university were afraid of the students. But now the students are afraid of the, the university. Perhaps afraid is not the right word, but kind of like, you know, like, okay, the students, they said that, they need something or, or they wanted this thing. Okay, yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. But now it's like, yeah, the students don't really say anything, so we don't have to really listen. Uh, it's like, I don't know, earlier, small example, but we wanted to, early in the semester, mm -hmm. we wanted to take this class. And it was a class that, for some reason, was restricted. Mm -hmm. And we went anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, but the professor was just like taking attendance. Never heard of anyone taking attendance, but taking attendance, great. And then, so I was like, listen, he's going to take attendance. He's gonna, I told him he's, he's going to find out anyway at one point. Yeah. So I'm just going to I'm just going to go up to him and ask him if he would let us just sit. Like, we don't care about the credit. Just let us sit so we can listen and learn. And yeah, no way. Like, no way. He was just like, nope, he's restricted. And I tell him he, it, 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 it was a mechanical engineering class. So like, yeah, that's yeah, not my yeah. major. It's like, it, I'm not going to go to take it because it's just I'm never, I'm never going to have the paper requisites or anything. I'm just going to sit down and just listen. Nope, nope. Everything you say. Uh, I mean, was that because of concerns about fire and evacuation and emergency? No, no, no. Like there was space in the class, like in the classroom ah. itself. But um, I don't know. Like I don't know why anyone would be opposed to like people. Like you, like we didn't want credit. Like yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we were fine with just learning about what was being taught. But oh, interesting. I don't yeah. know. But the I'm not familiar with that. I just one example. I mean, many professors yeah, yeah, are yeah. great, but I just one example of like. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Um, yeah, no. I, I, hopefully, you're not either. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know the dynamics of that class. Yeah. Um, I do, I do worry about. Like, I know I have some students that actually write scripts to try to get into classes that have, you know, caps. And so the idea that you have all these different algorithms running around trying to get students enrolled into a classroom, um, 
you know, makes me wonder, like, mm -hmm. maybe we need to, you know, address this if, and I think people are even selling scripts that do that now. Like, you can pay money to buy a script that will continuously try to log in to get you enrolled in the class so you don't have to sit there all day and, you know, check the button. Um, so it seems like there's a lot of demand for some classes and not enough space. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I don't know if it means that um, we need to hire more faculty to teach more classes. I don't know if it means that, that um, you know, there's, they've accepted more students than, than they can handle. I don't know what it means. But, I, um, I think it's a combination of, the, of, of everything, but it, also it used perhaps being more open about things. So like, let's say like the, the lectures are recorded yeah, or yeah, like yeah. Canvas, for instance, one of the worst things ever to happen in the history of the world, <laughs> having like the knowledge restricted. Mm -hmm. I mean, the CS professors are, are usually good because they have their own websites and everything is public, mm -hmm. which is, it's, it's a nice, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the computer world, it's like normal to have that. But and in the past, you could look up, okay, math class. Okay, here you have all the practice tests. And it actually helped me because I'm, I like to teach myself things. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. always things. But now I cannot find anything. It's really restricted. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So maybe that's interesting. it's not even about the man or anything, it's just about having everything open. Um, yeah, I wonder how much of that is Coursera. And um, like because of the existence of Coursera. We need to or like intellectual property like right. people viewing that materials intellectual property well, of course is yeah. free uh ish ish, ish. Well, you could still take the thing and learn the stuff yeah yeah but the material that you put on it um you know you have to make sure that it's it's your intellectual property um yeah i don't know i don't know why that is i'm wondering if it if it's just also the same in all disciplines um that would be an interesting thing to check. Like I was talking to a colleague recently and you know they're doing a lot of analyses looking at um, course descriptions um, and what, like how many classes address ethics, how many don't, <laughs> you know, not many do. Um, I wish we had a little bit more on that. Um, but yeah, the, the access I think is interesting. Um, you know, when I first started, like I said, the, the web didn't exist and it existed later. Um, and then there was this trend to have everything be very, very open. And then um, later I started seeing things be a little bit more restrictive. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know now. I don't know. And when you say Canvas being a terrible thing, do you mean um, Canvas the system for like submitting grades and for getting assignments? So I don't know if you know what Canvas actually is, but uh, Canvas is this platform where people are able to do kind of everything. So they're able to like uh, put the lecture slides, create the homework. Yeah, so we're talking about the same thing. Right. Yeah. And the, the reason yeah. why it, it's it's bad. and prior to that we had Blackboard, which right. was Compass, uh, just, yeah, still yeah. the same Moodle. same thing instead yeah. of like, but like the some of the professors, like for example, Professor Gupta, mm -hmm. everything is there. Tests and peace. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these CS professors actually do they have their own websites and they, everything is really nice and they have their slides. So if I want to teach myself something, I can just go. I don't yeah, need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and also, I mean, it's nice because, you know, there's a lot of people around the world that could just learn and, but yeah. that's not how people think. Yeah, I don't know why people yeah. do that. I know it's very common in CS to have things very public. Right. Yeah, at least maybe I'm behind the curve. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's just a culture thing that some yeah. fields have, but who knows? I do know that for some, like there's certain writings that um, are copyrighted that should not be publicly available. Right. Like that can be given in different ways. And I know that for student work, I mean, just to show you how norms changed, um, you know, when I was younger, they would put all of our schoolwork online. And now when I first got here, I started doing that too, because it was a norm. But then students were really upset. They're like, no, please don't do that. Um, they're like, you know, I'm getting my first job and I don't want to be embarrassed by this assignment I did, you know, like X mm -hmm. years ago. And so we stopped doing that. Um, and then FERPA became a thing too. And it was, you know, kind of, it was very connected to that. Right. Um, but norms come and go, norms change for various reasons. Um, but it would be interesting to like interview faculty and ask them why things are there versus elsewhere. I would be really curious to see <laughs> uh, what like that type of interview would, would result in. 
Yeah, I mean, mostly it's because that's that's what I mean. People don't know how to create a website, so they're not going to create a website. Go through it. Oh, Google Sites is like well, there are like with WordPress and you know you can create a website now with Word even. Um, and Google Sites makes it pretty easy, but I mean, what you might also be getting at is that people are so busy yeah. that any extra thing they have to do right. means that maybe they're not going to spend time with their family. Like mm -hmm. it's hard to calibrate what what trade-offs people are balancing. Yeah, it's either yeah, perhaps you could just create a canvas-like thing that is just free; anyone can open and yeah. can see. Yeah, it wouldn't be that hard, but hopefully mm. someone creates it. <laughs> But it, it, it always, it's a matter of like, you know, friction and, you know, what is the thing people are using? Okay, college, the college says this or have your own website. What's the easiest one? Yeah. One. I think one of the functions of Canvas is um, it allows for secure grading mm -hmm. or the, the transfer of secure grades. And I think it fits the, um, the FERPA compliance um, requirement. Um, and so, yeah, I would... I would have to, you know, talk to the people that made the decision to use that versus something else. And like, I know we're not allowed to discuss grades with people via email because it's not FERPA compliant. Interesting. Um, and and, and the, the thing with, okay, you have FERPA now, but it's there and it's never going away, which is the problem with like regulations and laws is that once it's there, to get rid of it, it just... Or to change it. It's, even. it's there. Like, you're not going to be able to get rid of it. Uh, if. No, I'm saying you we should, but it's more like yeah. Laws I are don't like, know. It, it didn't exist at some point, so yeah. something changed. So who knows if things, you know, what will cause something to change or not? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What advice do you have for someone in high school or in college about how to live a life that they're proud of or live a life that, you know, of socially and ethically when they create new things? Like, what advice do you have for them? Well, I guess, firstly, I would tell them to try lots of different things to find something they're passionate about. Um, like, I, it's, it's hard when you see somebody, like, narrowing so early in yeah. life about what they're going to do. So just, you know, especially because, you know, the profession they have may not exist today. Right. You know, explore lots of different things. Um, I, I even talked to my graduate students. I'm like, first of years, try everything. Like take lots of classes everywhere, try different, like learn different research methods. Um, and I can tell you for every one of my PhD students, at least who've started, like they had an idea coming in about what they wanted to do. None of them have done that, but they've always done something better. Mm. And so um, I would I would encourage them to explore lots of different spaces to the extent that the system allows them to. Um, and just try to find something that they like um, and not to, you know, to stop and talk to people, not just to focus primarily on, you know, the craziness of GPA and academics, mm. um, but to sit down and make connections. I mean, we all know that... Um, you know, that connections help us with our mental health. We all know that um, connections help us find jobs later in life. Um, but to, you know, prioritize that. Um, and I would also encourage people to, you know, take, this is my, my pet peeve, take ethics classes and design classes early on. Don't save them to like the very end mm. before you leave. Because if you take them early, you can actually think more critically about things that you do later on. Right. Um, sometimes I see people leaving those classes like right before graduation. Um, take them sooner. <laughs> and also we're sitting in the Siebel Center for Design. Um, design is such a powerful communication tool. I would encourage more people to take design courses. I, I found it pretty fascinating that you like even had you had your bachelor's in like engineering you did your phd in like media arts and yeah it was it was so much fun like i i shared an office like with a photographer like i interacted with a ballerina and like a an olympic luge you know competitor um but seeing sort of like the um what different disciplines 
valued and what the milestones were in different disciplines really right. helped you, you know, think about problems in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so, like, for example, a computer scientist building a tool for medicine without consulting with people mm -hmm. in the medical field or people in related fields, um, you know, puts them at a huge disadvantage and in a position where they can cause some damage. Uh, but being in a space where there's lots of different people um, and you can get feedback um, is is great. Another thing I would tell students, this is something I wish somebody had told me, was that don't be scared to ask for feedback before something is complete. Um, the discussions that you have, like the back and forth, will make things so much better. Whereas I had this tendency to be such a perfectionist and I didn't want to show anybody anything until it was like near done. But it's never done, right? Like... It'll never be done. And so the sooner, you, the more iterations you go through something, the better something's going to be. And I don't, I didn't understand the value of iteration um, until graduate school. I also never really learned how to write until graduate school. And I think maybe I was, I was, um, I went towards engineering because I didn't have to write so much and because it was just like metrics and I could rely on myself. Um, but Learning to collaborate um, is also another skill I would encourage people to to work on when they're undergrads for many reasons. Um, you know, you might end up working in a company and you don't always get to choose who you work with. Right. Um, but also in life, you're going to meet lots of different people and you're going to have to navigate some situations um, that you're not going to choose to be in. Um, so learning collaboration skills, I think, is something that we need to emphasize a little bit more. And people should like maybe not avoid it, but just jump in and mm -hmm. just like try to learn from it. No, and, and I think that the piece of feedback, asking for feedback, is critical. I mean, I just read, I read, I released a project last week, mm -hmm. and the name was not the name was a little out there, and I was talking to this big TV channel about getting an interview mm -hmm. to promote it, and the person was like, "Yeah, it's a great initiative, but a horrible name," mm -hmm. and I cannot talk mm -hmm. about it because if I say the name, we would get fined. It's like, oh my god! Oh, so, I, so I wish I would have gotten more feedback and people did tell me but i still want to go with the name just to try the experiment yeah yeah but, yeah uh, that's yeah always feedback and getting as many iterations as possible for yeah you. yeah Obviously. like that's not something that i understood yeah. going in <laughs> um and i also like i wish i had taken more open-ended classes in the sense that i took most of my classes were like here's a problem set there's like one right answer um but going back to the critical thinking part of it um, classes where there isn't just one right answer, where, you know, your brain has to take you places where, right. where you, as long as you justify something, um, and critique it and, and defend it, um, like that, that type of critical thinking was something I wish, I wish I'd known then that it was a skill that I would have needed later in life. And I just never... I, I just didn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's, that, that discussion that you have, you know, you, you believe in this idea, you need to like prove it and just by communicating, not using math proof. Something we did early in the semester, we went to this random philosophy class, mm -hmm. just showed up. Yeah, and, <laughs> that's awesome. And, 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 and it was it was funny because... Do you guys just go to random classes and just sit in? <laughs> yeah, we, it's we, great. we did that over like the beginning of the semester. We were like, yeah, because I mean, that's, that's you get to learn, you get to see yeah. how, people, how different people are. And you should have a podcast about that. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is interesting. Yeah, so in in that class, it was mm -hmm. talking. Okay, you have these two philosophies for how to live life and whatever. Yeah. And then people were like, "No, I think this is wrong." And like, "Oh, yeah, that's true." And I know because I think this thing is right. So like, yeah, that's, that, that's fun. That's like that 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 skill like is important, but it also tells you like what to trust, who to trust, um, how to think about primary, secondary, like like different types of sources, um, but also how to how to communicate. Um, like we have some amazing researchers here doing exceptional work, but if they can communicate to the public, like you said, like, you know, it, it's, it's hard for it to be used in the world, right? Mm -hmm. It's also hard for them to get these jobs if they can't communicate the work that they did in an interview. Um, the grants. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's something I wish I had, you know, known more of. And I also, I wish I had spoken up more in school. Like I came from a culture where um, you didn't speak back to people that were older than you. Right. And especially if you were female, you didn't speak up. 
Um, and it took me, I struggled a lot my first three years to be able to ask a question and to be able to, to um, you know, resist a response and ask for more detailed response or, you know, contradict someone. That took me a long time to, to do. And that's how people can get feedback and that's how you change things. Because if you don't say anything, you're not going to be able to create the nonprofit auditing algorithm. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, there's lots of things that need to be done. But yeah, I do, yeah. I do think we need something <laughs> like that. Um, you know, there's like, yeah, just go, there's a medical device recently that had this algorithm in it that, that was supposed to take like an average window of, of data, but they only averaged like the last two numbers. And it was yeah, and this this medical device could cause such harm, but it was like people weren't allowed to audit it. And there's this other um, law that um, came into play called the Right to Repair Act, right, which um, has some similar sort of like you know issues around it, and it's affecting people locally in our space. You mm -hmm. know, um, there are tractors that people buy that well, that they technically lease them now. And in the past, you know, farmers had this do-it-yourself culture. You asked me earlier if it was important to be able to build something. If you were a farmer, it was very critical that you could repair your tractor. Mm -hmm. um, with these new tractors, you are not allowed, the second you touch it, you void the warranty. Um, and you're not allowed to do that. And you have to wait for some representative to come out and fix it. And so that changes the whole, like we talked about workflows a lot, but it affects the whole workflow of the farmer changing mm -hmm. that. Um, and so... Yeah, I'm digressing. Apologies. Do you but, do a lot of things? Uh, I, mean, I didn't see anything that too much related to to healthcare. But like, are you doing a lot of healthcare research, or is, we've is that something you want to do? Done a lot of work around autism spectrum disorder right, that's what I saw. and um, and machine learning in that space. Mm -hmm. Not for diagnosis, I want to stress, uh, but for encouraging communication with parents and clinicians, and with advising in decision making. Um, we've also done a lot of work in um, with a people with aphasia, um, and are now looking at some projects around machine learning workflows to to help with um, concussions. Hmm. Um, and there's been some other parts along the way. We did a lot of participatory design, um, following students, um, you know, and getting their feedback and what they needed. So, for example, um, you know, a student in a wheelchair. Um, didn't understand why in a movie theater the counters had to be so high. Like, she wanted to look somebody in the face when she bought a movie ticket. And so she was like, well, maybe I could make like a robot and I could just put on the counter and they could have some of these interactions for me. And there were some people who wanted tools that like they had a hard time saying no. Mm -hmm. They just wanted like a tool that would say no for them mm -hmm. and like support them as they <laughs> said no. And so um, I love like these little design interrogations where you, we call them like, Cultural probes. It's a name that a uh, researcher named Bill Gaver came up with. And, um, but like providing lots of different opportunities for people to come up with things that they might want, but not know that they want. Hmm. Like the person like didn't know that they wanted like a tool that just said no for them yeah. before the beginning of this process. But by the end, they're like, this is what I want. <laughs> Maybe it made it, made the person more confident to say no, like even without it. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, so those kind of projects I love. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's important to, to the divide, you know, things that, I think that there, there, there should be two types of things, uh, people who use fellow curiosity and create things for themselves in a way, and then once, you know, it's becoming and bigger and whatever, then yes, you should have participatory, like, research and stuff yeah. like that. Because, and I'm not saying there's only yeah. one way to do it, right. right? Like, I don't think we mean we shouldn't stop curiosity-driven work. Right, right. Um, I think it's important to, you know, understand lots of right. different methods and, you know, know when to use the right ones and when to, you know, alternate a little bit. And Yeah. So we have a section that we call the overrated or underrated. Okay. So we ask uh, you a, a question or a statement or a topic, and you tell us what the, wait, whether you think it's underrated or overrated, and then tell us why. Okay. Are you ready? I uh, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so suing the government, overrated or underrated? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think it's underrated. There was a lot of work that went into that. 
Um, and I should also mention that we were really lucky that we had the, the support of the ACLU, but it took many, many years. Um, and it's baby steps to make progress, but I think it's important for people to realize that you need to try. Mm -hmm. So I would say that I hope people appreciate it more later. So I think at the moment it's underrated. Because they have this learn selfless self helplessness that you you know it's the government. To you know? be honest, I had it too. Yeah. If if the ACLU hadn't stepped in to help us, um, I'm not sure I could have found the money, you know, for example, to to do this. Thank you for doing it. <laughs> Twitter. Underrated or worried. Um I love Twitter. I love Twitter. Um I'm trying to think of what underrated or overrated means in the situation, um, because I think Twitter just is. <laughs> um, it's there. Sometimes it's underrated. Sometimes it's overrated. Hmm. Um, I think time will tell, like what what's happening right now. Um, but I do think it provides an interesting channel. Um, so I have to choose one of the two, right? Mm -hmm. I can't just say it just is. Well, um, you, you can say that too. So. Yeah, I'm going to say it just is because sometimes it's overrated and sometimes it's underrated. Okay. Um, How about the, the new owner buying the thing and how it changes the dynamics? I think it's very soon to tell. I think it, you know, keep in mind, I only know what I read from the press. So I'm not on the inside. I don't know what, what it, discussions people are having there. Um, I do understand that it's a business that they want to make profitable. Mm -hmm. um, I did express some concern when um, a bunch of people that dealt with data credibility were let go. Mm -hmm. um, this was a situation where, you know, they're making changes quickly um, and then waiting and seeing what happens. And I think when you do that with real humans, I think there's a real danger. And so I wish that wasn't happening. And I wish that there was some institutional memory from the previous um, governance team into the new governance team. Mm. Um, and so I don't know, I don't know Elon Musk. What do you think uh, of the uh, the Twitter files thing that happened? I don't know if you saw what happened. Uh, With the like collections and... You know, I haven't read them myself. I've only read people discussing them. Okay. Have you read the actual documents? So they haven't released fully everything. Okay. And what they released... It was like part one. Yeah, and what they yeah. released was not exactly everything because what happened was that there was someone in the FBI in Twitter mm -hmm. who alter things. Oh, so he got messier interesting, than he was. interesting, so, interesting. So, but what was released was basically people from both parties telling, hey, remove this, remove that. And, oh, interesting. And people just, yeah, and uh, it's, uh, I think. Yeah, it, it, I have it, not it, seen the source material. It, it was a joke because uh, people were saying, yeah, it's, it's been handed or it's been, it's been done. Handled. I've seen handled. people, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen handled. people discuss what they've read, but I haven't. I would, I would want to look at some of the original documents. Um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like, I, I do think there needs to be some. Moderation. Consistency mm -hmm. and some moderation, yeah. Yeah, I mean, also I think the thing that's the thing that has been shown so many times is that what works in the U.S. doesn't necessarily work elsewhere. Right. And I think one of the problems is like we focus so much on the U.S. market, and I think in terms of content moderation, like in Myanmar, I think there's like maybe just one person mm -hmm. um, managing content moderation, and if they don't even know the culture and the norms, like they just can't do what they need to do. So like, it would be nice for there to be, you know some thought that an interface that works or an infrastructure that works in this country may need to be different in a different country. Um, but um, yeah, so I mean, this, this Elon Musk has like a successful car company, um, SpaceX, um, a tunnel company. It looks like they may want to start their own <laughs> um, you know, cell phone platform. I think they. I think he said earlier that he might charge Apple more for some of their tools than. Yeah, I don't know. And Starlink. Um, Neuralink. 
yeah, Neuralink. So, I mean, clearly they're, um, you know, they love technology um, and they want to make, you know, they want to affect the world in some way. Um, you know, we'll see how that happens. I think that it's, um, again, the situation where it's kind of like very early to tell what's going to happen, but I have seen some some troubling signs of content on there that previously would have been removed and is now not removed. Okay. Uh, next one. Mm -hmm. Eureka yogurt. Overrated or underrated? Underrated. <laughs> totally underrated. It's the one here that we like commercially like get here even like close enough to like the authentic one. No, no. You really have to go mm -hmm. get like the the yogurt made from sheep, like in the ceramic container. <laughs> yeah, that, exactly. Like that's what you want. Yeah. What do you think of the uh, I think they come in Shabani or something? Shabani. No, 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 no. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think any Greek would approve. Yeah, I don't know. But, uh, the the story was interesting. How the guy created it um, and he tried to do it, but I guess it's not good. Oh, you you know more about it than I do. Uh, no, it was interesting because the the guy was also it's a Greek person, mm -hmm. and what he did is that he bought some old factory that made cheese in New Jersey or uh -huh. somewhere around there. And what he did is that he bought it. And so he started making the sugar at, at home and then he started growing and he bought this old cheese factory and mm -hmm. he started just making the thing and, and going back into, into Greece and trying to make it better. Oh, interesting. It's a, it's a nice story. Oh, wow. Look at that. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, the the person saw someone from the U.S. who just tried to you know, make rejigger like commercial. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh so no, I didn't know that. You would, you would enjoy this story. Mm -hmm. Self-driving cars. Ah, uh, you know, <laughs> at the moment they're overrated. Mm. Um, maybe one day they'll be underrated. Um, you know, the vision for it is an interesting one, like fewer accidents. Right. Um, the vision for Coursera was different than what happened too. Like the vision for Coursera was there'd be lots of people in third world countries taking classes and everything will be great. Um, that didn't quite come to fruition. Um, I, at the moment, they are, I would say, overrated. Have you heard of Comma AI? I um, have not. No. Uh, okay, so there's there's a guy called George Hutt, mm -hmm. and he created this company called Comma AI, mm -hmm. which is basically um, he retrofitted his car with like sensors and like cameras and everything. And he just basically made a normal car into a self-driving car. Oh, wow. And um, he's basically like a competitor to Tesla now. Oh, interesting. And once we just thinks he can do it, do it better than them. So yeah, he yeah, just, yeah. I will look into that. Yeah, I'm so, really curious. So the way to think about that is that it's not just he made his own car. It's just that he created, so Apple, I mean, Tesla is like the Apple iOS. It's, you know, it's closed. Mm -hmm. so you don't really see what's going on. And Android is a little bit more open source. Yeah. So, so Call My AI is like the Android of self driving. Got it. Got and it. So the code is on GitHub. Oh wow! Open source. So I will can, check that out. So you can read in, and so how they make money is that they they sell this device you can put in your car and your car is completely done. But if you. But what about the cameras that you need all around it? I think you yeah you need to like the device and a little bit. Yeah, more it'll things. be a little more set up than yeah. yeah. But uh, the code is open source. Okay, interesting, so interesting. Can, and I'm guessing there's no radar. Um, I don't think they're using lighter, yeah, or okay. radar. Okay, interesting. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, look into that. <laughs> it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. yeah. I will send you uh, an email with, with that. Yeah, and, please and, do. Another thing, because uh, I think you would enjoy uh, the uh, like, uh, JCR like lighter. Have you heard of the book Green Machine, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you read it, maybe? You know, I my memory fails me. Okay. Who Who wrote Dream Machine? Actually, I have Dream Machine. That I do have the book, and I bought it used. I think it has like a. I can imagine the cover right now. So, so this person, glasses maybe. And um, Dream Machine, I believe, somewhere in my grad school era, um, did hit my brain. Came out in the nineties, I think. But the, the, there was a new. Stripe just has their own publishing company and they remade yeah. the cover and everything. Oh, see, if I had my phone here, I would be looking. That's another <laughs> horrible habit that I have is like I look things up mid-conversation. 
but I left my phone at the other end of the room. I, I have, I have it, and it's a wonderful yeah. book. So basically, it tells you the story from like the internet and computers yeah. from the very beginning. I think, yeah, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that's somewhere in our house. And there were a lot of things that happened at MIT that, yeah. I mean, when you were there in the 90s, 80s, it, it was kind of that, that was done, but uh, the 70s, and he was, yeah. was a guy who just managed everything. He gave money to people. Yeah. Are you familiar with Angelbart, maybe? Uh, who? Angelbart? Uh, Engelbart. Engelbart. Yeah, 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 yeah. Engelbart, so there's a book underrated. similar to this. I think he's underrated. Yeah, I think Bill Buxton has a nice history too okay. of of you know some of these you know computing stories and design. Um, and a lot of the authors of these books are just sort of like blending into one person in my brain. But yeah, Engelbart's work um, was incredible. Um, you know, if you if you look at some of it. Um, there's an interesting backstory there too, in this, excuse me, in the sense that, um, like he did like early markup languages before everyone else teleconferencing, but his vision of the world mm -hmm. was that you would have like these computing systems that would be used by experts. And if you wanted something, like you would go to an expert and have them do it for you. Right. And at the time there was a gentleman named Alan Kay who was drawing pictures of like little kids sitting under trees with what looked like a laptop. And that was the idea of like, democratizing computing and having like everybody be able to do it. And so these were some of the discussions that people were having like at that time. The Dyna book, I think it was called, or something like something, that. Something, yeah, yeah, something and, like and that. It pretty much looks like an iPad-ish. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. Yeah, and then, yeah, no, I, that book talks about all that. It, it, I mean, Uncle was a very interesting person. Uh, the, I don't know if you heard of the, the mother of all demos. Yeah, 1968. What, 1968. Yeah. November 24th or 23rd. Yeah, I showed like that in my class. So, oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, wow. So, yeah, yeah. so in, in this, he talks about the like, teleconferencing, mm -hmm. the, the mouse, people like the Zoom and the Google Doc, you know, working the same document. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you heard of Brett Victor? No, I have not. You wouldn't very much enjoy this person's work. Basically, yeah. he's another computer scientist who uh -huh. is kind of, See, Ooh. we should do this more often. I'm learning so much <laughs> from you. He, he's taking on this vision that uh -huh. Engelbert has, uh -huh. and then re creating new tools of thought. Okay, okay. And he has... I will definitely check that out. And his website is wonderful. Like, okay. Even the Brett, website itself is okay. super impressive. But I may tools. have to follow up an email with you on that. No, no, I will send you an email. Yeah, thank you. With all you. the things we're, we're talking you. about right now. Because, yeah, that, that's wonderful. It is... Engelbert is one person I've, I've been reading. I, 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 want, I, I think I want, may want to write a book about... His ideas, because you know it's very underrated. Yeah, People yeah, don't know yeah. much about yeah. how what computing would have you been You might like some of the work of Vannevar Bush too. Um, oh my goodness, yes. Yeah, and so I mean, in terms of you know force foresight that um, that letter to FDR that just led to like basic research and all these yeah, research yeah, institutions yeah. Is yeah, different world. <laughs> yeah, maybe people also don't realize that like with Plato. Um, this was the first place that actually had like an electronic online political discourse where mm. um, somebody from here put up a discussion asking what people thought about um, about um, Nixon and, and Viet the Vietnam War. I'm not saying it's not about Nixon and Watergate. Um, and it caused like this dilemma on campus and in the government because the government was funding Plato. I believe it was the National Science Foundation that was funding Plato. And then the government was also funding um, ARPA at the time, as it was called before DARPA. Mm -hmm. And the student was also like putting messages across each of these platforms. Right. Um, but this idea of like having these online discussions about the government when you're funded by the government, that was like a, an interesting conflict for the time. Mm. But um, I'm digressing again, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't know much about the history of Plato. Uh, it's a fascinating, yeah. it's a fascinating history, like especially they, there were Plato terminals in elementary schools nearby. Wow. Um, and in the 80s, they, they were some overseas. And in many ways, you know, one could argue that it was kind of ahead of its time in the sense that um, paying for, you know, using a modem and paying for, you know, internet service at the time was just prohibitively expensive. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, fascinating to see some of the the course material that they made for Plato and um, the technologies that they built for it. Some of the conflicting discussions about how to properly teach on it. Um, yeah, you seem like the, the CS department before 
was a lot more vibrant or like you know, it was more like there were a lot of more things happening and I'm sure there are things I just I cannot think yeah. of well it's interesting like in the 50s I don't think there was a CS department here not at all yeah um, and so I think CS came about a little bit um, a little bit later typically in most schools it came out of the math department right um, I think Ilya care was pretty big um, but and that was model F of ENIAC um, but yeah, it's a, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very, you know, like long history before my time, and I wish I had known some of the, I wish I knew some of the details hmm. around there that I, they were just before me. There was an, another thing, just random, but uh, th th there was an important meeting mm -hmm. that kind of defined a lot of the computing. Is that there was this, this research conference at in Illinois, mm -hmm. Allerton specifically, uh -huh. where Alan Kay and all these people, all these researchers. Mm -hmm. That uh, ended up, you know, shaping all of the tools, and they they met here. I didn't know that. When they That's were super cool. when they were grad students. Really? So they were just. What year was that? Another year. I keep oh, getting back wow. to you on that. But uh, so wow. they, they they all had all these grad students all over the world, like Stanford, wow. Boston. We should do that again. <laughs> uh, and yeah, they just met here in Allerton. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, all, all literally all these people ended up becoming, you know, influential. Wow. Uh, something something interesting too. Yeah! 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 Yeah, I mean, it's such like they, they came together like in that space and then yeah, they shared their ideas. That's, yeah, that's awesome. Like now you look, oh, of course, like, they became big, you know, famous people or whatever. But, uh, you know, now like we have so much potential all over the, but like it's not, yeah. we need to bring them You know, to like, a... like John Cage used to come here too, Merce Cunningham, like brilliant people and like music and mm -hmm. dance. So it was um, an interesting hub for, um, for like, new forward thinking ideas we need to get that going again yeah there's some interesting theories about like how you know sometimes creating a official like music building changes some of that like right. with the performing arts but um i would need to talk to somebody who actually studies that to know for sure hmm. um but it's kind of like a um you know universities still offer that like people still come like COVID obviously made it a little bit harder. Right. Um, there's still lots of machine learning events happening on Allerton and many other events. So people do come together. Um, so who knows, maybe 20 years from now, we'll hear of some other event that happened <laughs> that... Um, Shapes the future. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah who knows? But uh, it, mm -hmm. it would be nice, you know. Yeah. Here, we're, we're talking about how to create, or again, like auditing algorithms and then whatever. And we're going to get the brightest minds all over the country, whether they are in high school or PhD or professor, and you never know who. Maybe we'll get some random kid in, in, in freshman year of high school who's figured out some way to audit algorithms yeah. from Ohio or whatever. Well, it's cool yeah. too, because if you look at some of the history in Plato, there were high school students coming in. Like mm -hmm. it was just like they would yeah. just go into the, the building and they'd just work on it. And, um, and there's a story, I don't know how true this is, but like one of the first ever like multiplayer games was on Plato, and apparently some of the parents went to the Urbana police and begged them to kind of like influence the university to shut it off at like 9 p.m. so that these kids would actually get some sleep and get some homework done because they spent all their time playing these <laughs> games. Um, but it was like it was like an interesting like just localized experience that, um, you know, didn't have the right monetary you know um infrastructure behind it and i guess i'm just speculating here right, right like right. i i i've only used simulators of it um i've never actually used like a real plato terminal right. um but you know when you hear people talking about it um and even just the idea of it like distance learning existed like the bbc radio had distance learning over the radio right and there's lots of open universities where you send stuff by mail um but the idea of like creating courses for this and people learning to program just to do that, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I think you've convinced me. Uh, I, I've been thinking about creating some sort of like this like localized community, like, you know, app or website or something. And I might start thinking about it over break. So yeah. maybe, maybe in general, cool. I'll have it done. Yeah, get back to me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Last one. Mm -hmm. um, Mathematica. Underrated. Yeah, Mathematica is awesome. 
I'm really surprised we don't use it more on this campus. Yeah, yeah. I I use it so much as a graduate student, and I play with it with my son. Right. Um, I make I'm intrigued by some of the newer tools they have too. Mm -hmm. Um, that um like show you step by step certain things. I think them a lot of them are more kid friendly. Right. So I'm excited about. You know what kids might do with some of these tools. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Mathematica is a brilliant tool. Like yeah. so, such a like it's still yeah. so well. Like it was made so many years ago, but it still I works know. so well. And they're like kept adding new features to it. And yeah, and the idea of the notebook that they came up with exactly. way before, Jupiter. like mm -hmm. yeah, like that. I didn't realize it then, but that might have been one of the reasons that that I liked it so much because it was so easy to share things right. in ways that you couldn't before, and so you got to share again workflow and process. Like we don't we talk we don't talk about that as much. We just talk about a standalone technologies, but not where it fits in the cycle of the project. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think one reason people don't know that much about it is because it's not cheap. Mm. Um, I was lucky enough to be in a university that had like a site license, right. and so I got—I didn't even think about the cost until much later. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's incredible. Like yeah, you, yeah. even like Wolfram Alpha that was built, f like with that base and like with that natural language understanding, which eventually led to Siri, and like mm -hmm. there's so much that happened just because of that one tool that was made. Yeah, and it was also like I loved this. You may be too young for this, but there was this this small episode in time when the Facebook 1.0 API was available, and Wolfram Alpha had this awesome thing that it gave you social network statistics about yourself and other people, <laughs> and like to see yourself from that representation is very similar to what I, I discuss in the social visualization class. Right. Um, but you know, it it basically embraced this idea of you know data about people and try to help you, you know, see it like in a different mirror. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was, um, I have some snapshots of it at that time. <laughs> Luckily that I do, because I, I didn't know that like the API would be, you know, obsolete. Right, right. Um, but I really loved some of the directions they were taking it into. And I like the directions that they're taking it now with some of the mathematics and the graphing and the fractals. It's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a... Uh... Yeah, it's definitely and in the community aspect too of uh, of that like Wolfram. So mm -hmm. I told you interview Wolfram, mm -hmm. and then we find out he, he, there, there was a Wolfram Tech Conference that the, that week. Oh, that, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's why they were here. Like, ah, so that Monday that was, that's when it would, when the conference started. God. So we, we 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 ask, hey, can we show up? And we yeah. don't because they're expensive, right? It's a thousand bucks it's just for students. It's really expensive. Yeah. So. Yeah, so the we asked him, yeah, the the person, the the assistant, replied, yeah, your your badges are on the on the hotel, just go uh -huh. get it. Yeah, and we, awesome. we we went every day. We spent a whole week there. Yeah, wow. We talked to so many interesting where was people. It? it was at uh, the Hilton, like Hilton. right, like, oh, you know where nice. where Wolfram Research is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right there. Okay, go. So we spent we spent a whole week talking to everyone there had a PhD. Like yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. had a PhD. So it's like you guys go to classes, you go to conferences. Like so, yeah, that, that should we, be a podcast. We didn't, we didn't go to class that week, but <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I mean like you like visit. Right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it was, it was that was amazing. Just yeah, people good for you. Because we saw so many applications. Like there were so many talks happening, and all of those talks were based on Mathematica and yeah. what they're doing using Mathematica. Like you would have astronomy. You would have there was one about machine learning, and there was one about uh, GB3. Like some guy like used like to find like Da Vinci notebooks. They had a, like yeah, a, a yeah, marking, yeah. like a marking thing, like the, the watermark. Mm -hmm. So this person, like you, 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 you can look at the notebook and it's not visible. But these, this guy used Mathematica and like for years he figured out some sort of algorithm that would let you see the watermark. Wow. And then it just like people were just like obsessed with yeah. the thing, just something you don't, I don't see that that much. And even art, remember? Right. A, a guy who, who got a, Masters in like oh, see, I wish that was a, do they have highlights of this for the public? Because yeah, might... they, they they record everything. They so I can send you the recordings if you want oh, to see. Oh yeah, they, you could. Did they upload it on YouTube? Yeah, everything. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's on YouTube. Okay, yeah. awesome, awesome. So and like some, like this guy used mathematics to create art, 
and he would give this tool to our students who've never yeah. touched a programming like computer device. And the, the students were actually really good at it. Mm -hmm. really well, awesome. that's, that's the thing. Like, if you have like an idea, something that drives you to do something, you'll find a way to do it. Exactly. Like, I remember, like, I was introduced to it early on, but I think the first time I started using Mathematica, like, religiously, was I was taking a robot vision class. I did, like, these triple integrals. And it was like, I could understand the concepts, but, like, solving all of these by hand was just getting tedious. And right. so I got to move faster and understand what I wanted to do and experiment just by putting them in there. Right. And, um, yeah, and so it made the class so much more fun. Yes, another tool. I, I wrote this essay about how to teach yourself math online, mm -hmm. and then I, I put it online, and someone from from Wolfram replied because I, I said that you know you shouldn't be using Wolfram too much because it, it could you know. <laughs> you should, and then the guy was like, no, 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 you should actually use it because he helps you visualize everything and like not do the uh, the uh, the manual work. And yeah, he was right. That's, so, yeah, that's so what I, had to I was add doing. To, to see it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was doing, and it yeah. it made the class so much more fun. Is the same thing about like do you focus more on how you're making the tool or how you're using the tool because the calculator same concept like it's helping you do these integrals and everything easier so that yeah it's fascinating but I, I think that would be a place to to end so yeah thank you so much thank for, you. for apologies coming. for the phone calls that's my husband he wants to get to underwater hockey and he's wondering where i am oh, <laughs> oh, <so sorry. laughs> oh no 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 it starts at 8 30 so let me just tell him but I'm really, I wish I could stay and talk to you more. You guys are amazing. <laughs>